Well, good morning. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bill says, okay, fine. I'll go and turn it down a little bit. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for returning. Um, and uh, welcome to the second day of the, thank you, Bill. You're a gentleman, a scholar. Okay. Um, welcome to day two of the spring 2022 Friends and Partners in Aviation Weather Meeting. Um, it is truly, uh, for those in the room, great to see you here. And um, um, we need to do this more frequently and not wait 25 months between meetings to, to do stuff like this. Um, for, for those uh, who were not here yesterday, um, the network you're going to want to point your uh, devices to is called OuterNet, and there is a four-word passphrase that is the, uh, the password to get into the system. You need the spaces between all the words, and if you do that, that was my, that was my next. <laughs> if you do that and your computer still doesn't like it, um, uh, forget the network and then reconnect it because you've probably got an old passphrase cached uh, in your system. That was for demonstration. Uh, yeah. So thank you, my 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 uh, my friend and colleague Claudia just demonstrated um, another point here, which is please mute your mics. Please mute your speakers if you have your laptop up, otherwise uh, you, you may get heard. The room is mic'd, and, and although um, uh, so it's, it's mic'd in the sense that if you have a microphone, you're going to be heard. If, if you're not on a microphone, you're not going to be heard, which, which brings me to another point. If you have a question or a comment, we have uh, portable microphones uh, somewhere or another. We have one on each row. Yeah, one, one on each row, I guess. And uh, so uh, please do wait to get your hands on a microphone before asking your question. I know it's awfully hard. I, I tend to want to just blurt out whatever I have in mind at that moment. But just, just hang on a second, get a microphone so the folks online and even in the room can hear you too, unless you're Gary, in, in which case you, you do not need a microphone at that point. <laughs> I love you, man. And you know what? I could be speaking about myself here, too, so that's, I'm comfortable saying that. Um, bathrooms, men's room is uh, out the back of the room on the left side as we uh, face the back of the room. The ladies' room, same deal, but on the right side. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, um, MITRE has a cafeteria. It is open now. You can see those of us up here eating breakfast uh, out either of the doors and to the right. And um, uh, you will find no cashiers there because, in fact, the food has been free here at MITRE ever since COVID started. So um, be reasonable, but help yourself. That's why we don't weigh more. <laughs> and, and that's why I was concerned when I came here <laughs> and hadn't tried on my pants ahead of time. This is my first post-COVID uh, <laughs> try on of these pants, but I got in them somehow or another. I know. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if you smell smoke, leave, and the, the best out, outside way is going to be uh, toward the stage side, toward the stage end of the room on either side and, and go outside. And um, as I mentioned, please do mute your mic and mute your speaker. And on that note, Joel, I'll hand it over to you. Only uh, we're D, D2, so that's not too, too bad. D4, actually. Yeah, okay. Over to you. So, so I have to press the speak button here, correct? Okay. Usually red means stop, so that's what I'm going to... Okay, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Translating Weather Information for Non-Meteorologists panel. In this morning's session, you'll hear from both weather and industry experts, including dispatchers, airline and general aviation pilots, and human factors experts. And for those who are thinking that you may have stepped into Oz after being secluded for two years, we will also have lions, tigers, and bears. There we go. That's what I was hoping for. In fact, it's right here in parentheses for the oh my. First up, we have a panel of industry experts who are going to help us set up the scope of our presentation. Who are we targeting in this panel? What are the issues we're hoping to address? And why is this topic important? 
Next, we're going to hear from the human side of things. We're going to hear from human factors experts about how pilot workload and perception both inside and outside of the flight deck can lead to poor decision making skills that can often lead to accidents later on in someone's career. Then we're going to revisit a topic posed yesterday by our esteemed colleague Marilyn Pearson on educating the right things the right way. We will talk about our struggles with the current requirements and the available resources that we have today. And on top of that, how we are working to better the training sessions of tomorrow. Finally, we're going to teleport the group 10 years into the future. Don't worry, it's safe. I promise no radiation and come together and take a look at the same issue through the glasses of the year 2032. What has changed? We heard a lot in the low level conversation yesterday about what is anticipated here in the future, but will the challenges of translating weather information look identical to today or will it look different? So with so much to discuss, I'm going to repeat myself here for the chat monitors. We'd like to be interrupted if there are questions, if there are comments in the chat room, we would like to know that that conversation is happening to be able to bring that virtual conversation into the in person world of the room here at MITRE. So with that being said, Matt, next slide, please, because I'd like to start a story. Once upon a time, there was a pilot. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start off with the why. Why are we even here talking about translating weather information? People, the, the meteorologists that are here in the room, we've been dealing with this challenge for probably most of our careers. Um, the problem here is that there, it's safety. It all boils down to safety. Our weather accident numbers, as you can see in the chart here at the bottom, the fatal numbers aren't really changing where we would really like to see them changing over the course of the past decade. We started in 2010 with 34, and here in 2019, just a few years ago, we had 30. We had four less. So pilots are still dying from weather accidents. The total number of accidents seems to have been declining, but the question is why? What can we do better? Why aren't they getting the right information moving forward that is not giving them what they need in order to operate a, uh, an airplane through weather? So the primary causes for these accidents are your visual flight into instrument flight, AKA you get these VFR rated pilots or these IFR rated pilots who aren't necessarily proficient versus current. Um, you know, they're legal, but they haven't flown in a while, so they're not used to it. And they get thrown into a cloud. They can't see the ground anymore. Spatial disorientation. They lose control of the aircraft and they. Hey, Joel, Bill Bowman. Um... Are those numbers for CONUS, the NAS, or does it include Alaska? What, what are those for those stats? I think we're going to see this again in the human factors. I stole this from Ian. So I think Ian would probably be the better one to, to answer that. Not going to participate, is he? He's oh, he I, is. Dialing I think in. he's online. Okay. Yes, okay. or will be online. All right. So if he doesn't answer that question in human factors, we'll come back to it. Um. So we've got thunderstorms, icing, et cetera, are all killing our pilots. 66.7% or two thirds of fatal accidents have an IFR pilot on board. The pilots who are supposed to be getting this extra training, the pilots who are supposed to be understanding weather just that little bit more than your regular private pilot are accounting for two thirds of these accidents. So in the lower right, I've written down the poorly translated or more accurately, poorly understood weather information can lead to loss of control in flight. And once you lose that control, it's a flip of a coin as to whether or not you die from it. So now that I've got some shock factor in the audience here, next slide, please. So I'm going to turn things over now to my esteemed colleague, Debbie, to my left. Um, Debbie Kovaleski is um, the director the leader of the uh, American Dispatch Federation. Uh, that's uh, secretary airline. of the Airline Dispatchers Federation. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, also a dispatcher for United Airlines. Um, recently, the NTSB, uh, more into the uh, why this is important, uh, recently the NTSB came out with their uh, safety research report on preventing turbulence-related injuries in air carrier operations conducted under Part 121. In that, they, um, they cited um, 
the lack of shared awareness of turbulence risks between meteorologists, dispatchers, air traffic controllers, and of course the, the pilots as well. Um, and, and my question is that obviously the report was on uh, turbulence related injuries, but couldn't that be true of other uh, severe weather um, as well, that there is a, a lack of shared awareness uh, because again, we aren't using the exact same tools and we certainly aren't using them in the exact same way. We aren't trained meteorologists. So we're looking at different things. Um, also in that uh, report, uh, the NTSB cited that there was an, uh, even an increased sharing of those turbulence observations. I know everybody's we need more turbulence observations, more, 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 more EDR reports, more of all of that. But even, even with that, um, that shared information, they say, also needs to be widely and commonly understood. So then we get into the training. Are we, are we really all trained to look at that and use that um, the same way? Next slide. So uh, a little bit into the who we are, um, I'll do the uh, dispatcher uh, part. We work with the pilots. ATC, uh, of course, in our offices, we usually have uh, air traffic control coordinators as well, um, who are usually dispatchers as well, just with an extra qualification. Uh, but they help um, coordinate with air traffic control. So we don't have individual hundreds of dispatchers calling ATC facilities are calling the command center. We have a, a few who will do that on our behalf, so it's a bit more coordinated. Um, also, uh, we'll have our trained meteorologists available. Uh, sometimes those are company, sometimes that's outsourced to a, a third party, but they're certainly there. And of course, we share operational control with the captain on the flight. Uh, we do have automation issues, of course, uh, just like everybody signing into a computer it doesn't always work great. Uh, our radar is at least six minutes old. Um, of course, in the airplane, they're getting something very current. Ours might be a, a whole lot older. Um, I'm also familiar at United, uh, the pilots use the uh, iPads uh, with uh, apps, and the apps do not function the same way that they do on an actual desktop. I have a desktop version of things on my computer. They have an app version on theirs. And believe it or not, sometimes the app is better, or so so we we perceive on our side of it. Um, and also, uh, of course, as I as I said, many different weather sources. So we can we can we do have the luxury of looking at a lot of different uh, sources or or third party applications uh, as as we sit on our desk. All right, over to the pilot side. Um, a lot of 121 carriers do not have the capability that a United Dispatch carrier has. There may be a carrier that has just a one-man show, or it may be just a paper release dispatch that comes out from a, uh, a contract support to that carrier. Um, United pilots are very fortunate, along with uh, several other larger carriers that do have the level of dispatch service that uh, Debbie was talking about. But there are some issues with that still, as she mentioned. I may walk out to the airplane and have my dispatch release on my iPad or in a paper form that you'll hear from uh, Captain Eden here in just a second. But again, we're not seeing the exact same thing. Uh, we may get information that's slightly different. And then when we talk to each other, it may be a good conversation or a confusing conversation. So those are some of the anomalies that we face uh, in the cockpit versus uh, the dispatch. Now, we do coordinate a lot of things together, and sometimes we may talk uh, prior, during, and after the flight. Um, I also know at United Airlines, there's a group that meets quarterly uh, with the pilots and dispatchers. 
and they try to talk about these anomalies that are going on and they try to coordinate uh, you know, better information, synonymous information together so there's a more common understanding. Now, as an initial pilot coming in uh, to a carrier, they typically now today have an ATP rating. And that's kind of the, the pinnacle, that airline transport pilot rating is the pinnacle. There's no master's degree or PhD degree that I have to get after that. I've reached my level. So what other additional training am I required to have? And we'll talk about that more in our training session. But at this point, as an initial pilot coming into a carrier, I'm supposed to have enough meteorological knowledge to operate my aircraft. What is enough practical meteorology knowledge? We'll talk about that some too. Um, so now I'll turn it over to uh, Captain Eden, who is on the line. He's a captain with uh, Frontier Airlines, uh, been with them for many years. And they're a different kind of carrier than what we talked about with the United. Um, he'll tell you some of those issues that they're facing. Um, go ahead, over to you. Mark. And, and Mark, uh, and Mark uh, before you do that, Joel, how do you want to uh, work with folks who have their hands up one, online? The, now, the chat room folks are watching the chat room. The hands up <laughs> ends up showing up on a different list. And I, I, we don't have necessarily a set of eyes on that right now. But we do have somebody with their hand up. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, Jamie, go ahead and ask your question if you wouldn't mind. Jamie. Oh, and hand went oh, away. Uh, I'm sorry. I must have hit the button by accident. I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. And, it, was, um, it was a test. We 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 passed the test. We're perfect. Good. Yeah. good to know. And if we could go back a slide, please. Back one I, slide. Yes, please. I don't think we were done with the the pilots aspect. Oops. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I was going to ask. Oh. Thanks. Yes, I was going to ask that we could go back one slide. Uh, first of all, as uh, Debbie pointed out, uh, we do have access to the dispatcher, and we do under 121 and certain 135 operations. Uh, have uh, have dispatchers which uh, share equal dispatch responsibility with the captain of the aircraft or the captain of the flight uh, in order to make these kind of determinations determination to make the determinations of whether or not the air the flight is safe to be operated with the conditions that are present at the time uh, as was also astutely pointed out there are a number of automation issues and kind of one of the things that's happening now is is that uh, the uh, the products that are available out there are outpacing, uh, in a lot of cases, the ability of uh, the regulator to determine, you know, uh, what the uh, the uh, what what really works and what doesn't work, um, which is something that I think that was touched on yesterday, and we're going to talk about that today a little bit more. Uh, other issues that we have are Wi-Fi availability, for example, uh, Delta, United, and a number of the other larger carriers have uh, Wi-Fi on board the aircraft. Uh, my aircraft, I have Wi-Fi while I'm on the ground, but on the ground only. And what I take off with is, is the information that I have with some limited uh, 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 ADSB in information that I do get uh, from having uh, ADSB in capability in flight. So, uh, but that, and that's improving on a daily basis, but it's not quite uh, where we need to really be making the kind of command and tactical decisions that we need uh, in order to be able to look beyond that uh, that 20 minute ahead look ahead that we looked at yesterday or we was discussed yesterday. So um, one of the other things that was that Debbie pointed out too is is that the tools that the dispatcher have are not the same tools that I have you know in the cockpit for example. Some cases uh, my information is better. Sometimes it's not. Uh, and uh, so, and the, some of us, you know, still, you know, have, uh, you know, require a, a tree be cut down for every flight that's operated. So I still get a, a 30 or 40 page uh, dispatch package that has both my weather and uh, my uh, uh, NOTAMs uh, in it as well, which uh, most of the companies have moved to a digital format. We're in the process of doing that, but things move a little bit slower at uh, at some of the ultra low cost carriers, I guess. Um, let's see what else. 
That's about all I had, Bruce is on that one. We can move to the next slide. Hey, Mark, we do have a, a question in the room here. Stand by one second, please. Oh, sure, absolutely. Good morning, Mark. This is Eldridge. You talked about hey, ADSB, ADSBN. Uh, are you getting a FISB input into your air aircraft with ADSBN? Yes. Yeah, we're actually, I get it actually through my Jeppesen app. Thank you. I think we're good. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to give you a couple of uh, examples of some of the different technology that we can utilize in the cockpit, uh, this is a United Airlines app, a WSI produced application that has a lot of information on it. And I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, I don't wish I had a, let's see. So I, what I did was uh, draw up a flight from Boston to Orlando. It's kind of hard to see the magenta flight track or flight path that, uh, we are supposed to follow, um, but along that flight path, you're going to get different hazardous weather phenomena information, access to that information. And blinker is right here. Yeah. Okay. So right here is the magenta line. Right here is the magenta line on both sides, followed with the uh, also waypoints on there. And as you traverse that flight path, you have different uh, polygon information that provide you information on convection, icing, turbulence. And what I did is draw up a cross-section view on the bottom uh, of turbulence guidance information off of the graphical turbulence guidance product, the GTG product. Um, now, I will note that Delta was way ahead of many other carriers in getting turbulence information, and actually their application has saved them millions of dollars in fuel costs by utilizing that turbulence glider bar for altitude. And if it looks like I'm going to have turbulence ahead that's maybe uh, moderate, maybe a little bit less light to moderate, I may decide just to put the seatbelt sign on and ride it out for 20 minutes instead of search for another altitude. If I don't have this information, then I may not be able to determine that and I'm gonna either ascend or descend and I'm either, I'm gonna probably burn more gas by doing that. And they have a lot of data over the last several years, um, but this is the type of information uh, that many pilots now have. Almost every 121 carrier now, the pilots are carrying iPads with some kind of, of weather information, whether it's JetView, a WSI, a homegrown Delta product. Go ahead to the next slide. And so this is another one that's come out new over the last uh, year and a half. It's, it's called Yamasi SkyPath. Unfortunately, it's independent, so it's uh, not integrated into the other. So you have to switch between applications. Um, this is strictly a turbulence product that's derived from the accelerometer in the iPad. Now, there's some issues with that because once I mount my iPad, it's supposed to stay there and get the information of the, the bouncing aircraft, right? And the accelerometer in the iPad. And it has an algorithm that determines what level of turbulence it is. And it can, you can see other aircraft that are using this same product. So right now I know JetBlue, United, American use this product and on the left side, you can you can click on a different aircraft that's around you and you can see what they're reporting also and then you get like a trail behind you like in the screen on the right and that's uh, a flight across the atlantic obviously 
and you get different levels of turbulence. Obviously, the darker colors are more severe than than the lighter colors. And you also get nil reported in the uh, white circles. So again, those are just a couple of products that we have uh, access to in the cockpit that I wanted to show you. Can, can I jump in with a question, actually? Absolutely. I actually have two. Um, first on, on this, what is the value at what is the value add of a product like SkyPath that you get across wherever the domain is that it, that it covers? It looks like it's global. What is the value add from SkyPath versus what we get from air reps that are currently ingested into Aviation Weather Center? And for anybody online from AWC, are you all aware of SkyPath? And are we, you know, are there any plans to like ingest this data or these data into? the AWC to be able to track these kind of accelerometer reports. Yeah, so the value add is is obviously if I don't have the type of product that I showed previous to this and my airline has bought this for me, then that is a value added product that I can have access to. Um, one anomaly that I didn't mention is if I demount my iPad and wanted to look at a chart down here in my lap or scroll through something while I'm uh, at 36,000 feet, it's going to get an erroneous reading to say that I'm, I've got turbulence. And unfortunately, that's something they're trying to work out of a, a human picking it up and moving it versus what is actually vibration in the aircraft. And it's, you know, it's obviously different in the nose than it is in the tail. And we know that that's a given, but when I pick it up, I don't want to get those readings and it will pop up a warning on your screen. If the app's running in the background, I don't want to have that happening. If I'm maneuvering it around and I want to show the guy next to me, Hey, you know, this is what we're doing, you know, that kind of thing. So any, anybody else online want to comment on, on Joel's question? I can jump into that as as well. Um, we have the uh, SkyPath on our desktop uh, at work, and I'll tell you the difference uh, between that and the Aviation Weather Center. Not all airlines pyreps go into the Aviation Weather Center. That simple. It's that simple. They don't all go in there. Uh, that was also one of the findings in that NTSB report that we need to get them all in there but currently i can tell you there's a certain uh airline um in dallas <laughs> um that puts theirs into uh wsi fusion and wsi fusion is a third party and they don't send that to the awc so at united we have our own uh pyrep uh, entry um program and that will put it into all the sources, but that's our own program. So again, it, it has to do with the sharing. So yes, you wind up looking at, at a lot of different sources for the uh, information. Yeah, and this is Dave from uh, AWC. I actually just wanted to thank you for saying that. You stole all my thunder and everything that I was actually going to, uh, to, to say to answer Joel's question. But it is also a shameless plug on my end to say, you know, PyREPs and AirRep data are not proprietary. Uh, I know that there's a lot of the uh, carriers out there that treat that as such, and I understand um, the competitive edge piece, but um, as you mentioned in terms of the NTSB study and the work that Bruce Landsberg is doing with us at AWC, yeah, we got to get to the solution on this problem. It involves getting us the data. That's all we need. Thank you, David. Thank you, Debbie and, and Mark. And um, I, I'd like to go to chat. I, I know we've got a couple of hands up. We've got a couple of questions. I'm going to start at the top here. Um, we had a question on your weather briefing document. This, I believe, was to Mark Eden. Um, on your weather briefing document of 30 to 40 pages, how many are actually notams? All but about four, probably. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Um, and then we had a question um, from Kevin Johnston over with FAA. So United has a performance metric that tracks turbulence and monetary savings. Is that routinely available? Uh, this is Nathan from United. Uh, we do not have such a metric. Uh, I believe the speaker was referring to Delta Airlines, and I think they've done some analysis on uh, how their pilots use their light weather viewer to change altitudes with the GTG Nowcast product. 
and they may have done some analysis on fuel savings. Um, I think that was referring to Delta. Perfect. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, that was uh, a reference to Delta's product, and I have seen those numbers, but I don't know how publicly available they are. Um, I believe they did publish one report uh, in an AMS in the past, so I will seek that out. T Tammy's on the move. Okay, thanks for the clarification. I'm sorry. I thought it was United that was speaking. So. They don't normally... Um, share that kind of detailed information we can get broad values kind of like what you said millions of dollars but to get more specific than that they don't share that with us um, uh, yeah, bill watts i see has his hand up I think if, if you were saving millions of dollars i mean i i would think you'd want to tout that I'd show it and, and you know again routinely track it but just that's just me. And I saw Bill Watts had the hand up and then took the hand down. Bill, did you still want to ask a question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I guess my mind is kind of exploding because nobody's talking about EDR, which is a publicly available metric that Delta used is using. United uh, was used. I don't. I think United has switched to the the iPad solution. But the the EDR is a very objective thing. It's 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 been proven, and it's just frustrating to see that the industry is going in so many different directions, and there is a path <clears throat> that that can be uh, followed that will get us where we need to be. But I. I just can't believe that we're st we've been working on EDR for 10 years at least, maybe 15 and 20 going off somewhere else. That's all I, I I'm sorry, I, I won't say anything else. It's just frustrating. <laughs> no, uh, Bill, Mark Fanoff here. Yes, you're absolutely correct. And I stayed away from, uh, you know, stating what is the normally used or uh, dare i say most used edr um obviously nx3 ikeo nx3 has uh named edr as the standard and i i know it, this is off topic but just to address your question uh we're working in rtca 206 study group four that Tammy Flo and I and Tim Ramos um, co-chair, and we are opening up DO370 again and determining whether or not it's an effective metric. And we are looking at all of the all of the turbulence metrics that are out there. And if I misspeak, Tammy, please chime in. Um, so yes, EDR is and has been out there for 20 plus years. Um, NCAR has done a great job with EDR in, in many respects and uh, most turbulence metrics can either, you know, we're getting a lot of feedback. Somebody's got an open mic somewhere. Okay. Um, most metric, turbulence metrics can output EDR uh, whether or not it's a TAPS based or you know other type of product, they can they can output EDR. Um, is it the same? No, there's differences, uh, but they can get to the EDR range. Yeah, go ahead, Tammy. Well, I'll just uh, just to update you since you've been um, retired for a little bit while now, but we are entering into a study funded by the FAA that you'll you'll appreciate we're gonna we're gonna figure out how to correlate these different methods so that they can be interchangeable so just maybe we can talk offline i don't want to hijack joel's yeah i have a quick here. question then mark with this on the device up here you said it matters where they mount it has anybody looked or do they put out as a corporate 
that the if two aircraft fly through the same area close that the output is results in the same operational decision i mean is there a correlation so if i mount it differently or it's in a different spot that i will at least get an output if you talk to a guy that it's close enough that the operational decisions will be the same or is there enough variation in the mounting the location the ipad form you know how you orient it and all that do they have data to show that it's consistent enough that you will always get the same operational decision from proximate aircraft? Yeah, great question. They don't track the operational decision based on that, that I'm aware of. They do track what the output was and is it consistent? You know what so I mean? Consist well, but I don't know what consistent is. So they have actually have a tolerance. It has to be within a certain percent that every aircraft that hits the same thing they can show will always, no matter where it's mounted on the aircraft. Yeah, I don't plus know. Plus or minus the same percentage. Hey, uh, yes, this is Nathan at United. I can United, speak, to that. speak to that. Thanks. Go ahead, Nathan. It, you know, I don't. They don't. They don't share their secret sauce, obviously. But uh, if you have multiple iPads mounted in the cockpit. Uh, the iPad has to be at a stable angle and it won't start recording turbulence until it's deemed to be you know, calibrated or stable. And so if you have a uh, captain and first officer both measuring um, turbulence on their iPads, the algorithm filters out the noise uh, and can tell what is turbulence and what's not. I mean, it's not foolproof, obviously, but if you have one iPad shaking like crazy and the other iPad isn't, the algorithm is, in, is intelligent enough to understand that that's probably not turbulence since those iPads are in the same airplane. So um, it's a crowdsourced method. So you you know the iPad is measuring turbulence essentially a hundred times a second, and I think the new iPads are a thousand times a second. So it's a lot of data, uh, and they've got you know a lot of work that's been done to remove the noise. So it's actually not so much of an issue as to where and how you mount it. Uh, it's about how stable the iPad is in that mount. And so, you know, I know there are reports of pilots tapping or typing on their iPad and showing up as turbulence. Uh, that was the case a few years ago when this started. Uh, I haven't heard too much of that, you know, recently from our pilots at United. Uh, it could still be happening. Um, but again, the point here is crowdsourcing the data. So each of those little tiles on the screen updates every minute, and it's about 10 by 10 kilometers, 2,000 feet thick. And so every iPad passing through those little polygons uh, will derive a turbulence value that updates every minute. So it's not even really a pie rep in that, in, you know, in the traditional sense, because you could have multiple iPads passing through those little chunks of airspace uh, at any given time. And so, uh, it, it is a little bit different. And to go back to a previous point about PIREPS, um, you know, at, at United, the pilots are still required to report moderate or greater turbulence to dispatch uh, using our PIREP processor. SkyPath does not absolve them of that responsibility. Uh, SkyPath is a closed system, right? It doesn't go to the National Weather Service or anything like that. Uh, and so that's one of the problems with these proprietary technologies, obviously, which I know Bill um, uh, expressed concern about. And so we're we're certainly actively working to uh, find ways in which we can distribute moderate or greater turbulence, you know, per, you know, our regulatory responsibility, uh, no matter where that moderate or greater report comes from, from the pilot, from some automated system, EDR, TAP, SkyPath. Um, and so that that is ultimately the goal and the, the work that the FA, you know, is going to fund will help us in that regard. Uh, because right now these systems are closed. You have to have this app and pay for the app to be able to see this data. So American Airlines, uh, American Airlines is very pleased, pleased with the, uh, the SkyPath app and we've integrated it into our uh, policies and procedures as well. And uh, our, uh, uh, you know, the what you're showing here is a, an older screen display, but uh, the alerting the capability to, to alert to an upcoming polygon uh, is uh, pretty significant uh, for us, and uh, we use that as an internal alerting system. Great discussion on the on the on the turbulence topic here. I, I, I was just thinking to myself, if I had a dollar for every time Pyreps comes up at FPAW. But I, 
I would like to move on if we can. Uh, we got a little bit more to cover through. Um, so if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, please, Matt. Okay, and uh, on this one, I was just looking at uh, convection, actually, sorry to take it away from turbulence. Um, that is good discussion. But uh, again, just looking at the multiple different uh, weather sources uh, that we have available to us, I only pulled up a few. We have many, 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 many uh, that we can look at. Our WSI uh, Optima in the upper uh, left-hand corner there. I can also look at a flight uh, horizontally as well, but that's the, the basic uh, kind of uh, regular display that we look at. Um, also, um, you know, looking at the uh, uh, AWC, um, the current uh, convective segments, uh, of course, the, the radar in the, in the lower right, and of course, uh, on the lower left, uh, one of my favorites, uh, the, the COSPA or the CWIS. Um, I know it's still technically experimental, but and I know the pilots can't look at it, but boy, it is great for the timing of a line of thunderstorms. If it's if it's air mass, you know, popcorn pops where it pops. But um, I can't uh, I can't really predict that. Neither can the tool. But uh, when it's a line and the pilot is sitting on the ground saying, "Hey, when it, when is this line going to move through? When can I take off?" Um, that can give me a really pretty good uh, timing on that, I think better than some of our other sources. So again, we're just looking at very different uh, different tools uh, sometimes and even sometimes the same tool, but in different ways. Um, also, really quickly, I just wanted to share a, a another story that Mark and I were actually talking about uh, yesterday. Um, Again, referring to we look, we all look at uh, the same weather, but in different ways. Once I had a flight that was going from San Francisco to Chicago, um, classic uh, spring or summer line of thunderstorms had formed from about South Iowa all the way down to Texas, and then there was a huge gap. Um, the whole northern part of Iowa was open. And nothing was there. And then they kind of started again up through uh, Wisconsin. So it was basically that one hole um, for traffic going from the East Coast to the West Coast and, and vice versa. So at, at a certain point, air traffic control had to get everybody through that hole. Well, of course, that led to some holding. I had a flight, again, San Fran to Chicago, kind of got up to the hole, was put in a little bit of a hold by ATC. Didn't like it. I don't want to hold. Um, ATC tells me that if I go a little bit north, and of course they already started going north. I'm like, hey, where are you going? <laughs> um, they started going north, and they said, oh, ATC tells me uh, that there's uh, some some gaps, uh, or it's better to the north. I looked at it, and I said, well, um, yeah, there are some gaps. Again, I'm looking at radar that's you know, five, six minutes old, so it's not quite as good. There, the the pilot was only looking at, okay, there's this one hole, but I don't, I don't want to wait for it. The air traffic controller is only looking at their sector. They don't know that through the rest of Wisconsin, and the guy had to go all the way up to Green Bay, make the right turn. By the time he got to Chicago, guess where the thunderstorm? Chicago. So, that, well, now you get to go to uh, Grand Rapids it on the ground and wait for those to get through Chicago and then guess what now you got to wait for them to get through Grand Rapids where you can take off and get back to uh, we're going to ground stop you we're not going to let you fly through it and and ATC is going to be saturated uh, with that work now of Chicago as well so again we're all looking at the same weather but we're all looking at different of the pie uh, if we could ever all be looking at same tool or way uh, uh, or have access. You know, if the air traffic controller could have looked at, oh, hey, wait a minute, I can't just send you off of my little sector. The other sectors are are bad as well. Let's just let's just do that. Um, the pilot uh, that was before the iPads, um, but of course the Wi-Fi is not always working on. It. Even if they have it, I know you've been a passenger in the back, um, and that Wi-Fi is. Not always working. Again, it's a third party uh, application. It's not owned by the airline. Almost all the cases, not owned by the airline. So, um, 
they don't always have that available. But if they do, of course, that is getting better. Wi-Fi is getting better. We're all got the iPads now. But again, if they can look at that, if we can ever all get on the same page, then much quickly can all get to this. Next slide, please. So we've heard about the different air, airline operations that have the good support, the support of dispatchers, the support of meteorologists, the support of air traffic control experts. Now we start delving down deeper into our charter operations, part 135, the general aviation, the people with such limited support that we really have to almost baby as we develop our products. So part 135 have fewer dispatchers. I say fewer because some of them have none, some of them have one, some of them have 20. Depends on the operation, jet links, gamma aviation, uh, jet suite. Some of the larger operations have dispatchers, but they're not meteorologists. They don't have a meteorological support. So they're going to the same websites that Debbie posted online. Well, two of the same websites because they're free and public, uh, free and open to the public. But we don't really know what information they're using. Um, so they're pretty independent in terms of their decision making process. Part 91, um, you know, it, it's funny. We sit there and we think about part 91 pilots um, equating to like the Bush pilots of Alaska. You know, they're just cowboys out there doing their own thing. But part 91 has regulations. Part 91 has regulations. Um, oh, I know. Um, but they're responsible for their own decision making. And as we'll get to later, and as Marilyn got to yesterday, uh, general aviation pilots are required to have, or not required, that's, that's the wrong word, are encouraged to have personal minimums, to have that personal level of risk that they can mitigate out. And they're required to know what that is themselves. They're taught that by their CFIs. So if their CFIs get bad, one, you know, get bad training, then the students get bad training. Um, they're also reliant on the publicly available weather source, your aviation weather center, your weather.com services. Um, it makes me shudder every time somebody comes up to me at a weather training and says, Joel, here's this weather radar picture. Why does this one look completely different than this one when it's the exact same time on the exact same day? And I said, well, it's the same radar. It's coming in from NOAA, but one may be based composite. One may have a different color code than the other one does that colors the 35 dBZ is green versus yellow and so they look differently um and again you also have the third party applications that the part 91 and 135 and even some 121s are starting to become a little bit more involved with um or relying upon is for flight and for flight does do a decent job from my perspective as a user of actually doing a pretty good um translation uh, next slide please now we go even further um part 107 your small uas operators um, like the Part 91 pilots and operators, Part 107, they're fairly self-reliant. The difference is that there's not really much publicly of actually help their their operation. As again, we heard yesterday in the low-level conversation, the DFA, et cetera, we, we've got these products that are a little bit more all-encompassing in terms of weather information, but the issue is is that still primarily aimed towards airport operation. These operators are not operating on airports. Um, the one that I've been on, I've been on one that operated on in Charlotte, and I've been on one that operated in a field 25 miles away from in the nearest ASOS state. How are we getting them support to be able to make these correct weather decisions? And then even more unknown are the AAM operators. As we go into that future, into 10, 20 years into the future, as we heard from Don in the group yesterday, we're making a lot of assumptions about these vehicles. There's a lot that we don't know. Aircraft cert over at the FAA, we still don't know how these are going to be certified. We have no idea what kind of operations they're going to have. There's been conversations of why can't we just call them like an Osprey, you know, can take off, you know, uh, or can do a vertical and horizontal operations. And the question that always comes up when somebody says that is, well, have you ever seen an Osprey take off horizontally? And the person says, well, no, I haven't. It's like, because they can't, you know, the propellers are too big. You know, they'll, they'll do ground strikes, but they, they cannot physically take off other than vertically. So how do you have these AAM vehicles that can do both? How do you certify those? And we don't know. We don't know how icing is going to impact 
a vehicle with 12 rotors versus two rotors, et cetera, et cetera. And so with all of those, you know, uncertain features of these vehicles, how do we know what kind of weather support and weather translation we need to have? All right. So, so we had a good discussion here about the myriad of different types of weather products that are available for these and how much access they have to them. So for the next portion um, of this morning's session, we're going to kind of drill down into the the basis of how how are humans making so once you have that weather information, whatever it is, what cognitively is going on um, in their minds and their perception that weighs into how they make those. So in, in this next portion, we're going to have Dr. Ian Johnson talk a little bit more about some of the accident information that we heard about earlier and looking at specific scenarios of when that interpretation of the weather information breaks down and accidents and incidents. He'll also talk a little bit about um, some FAA work uh, that has been conducted in what is it about the weather information that is interpretation, whether that be color differences, format, whether it's gridded, um, textual, et cetera. Um, and then we're going to have Dr. Meredith Carroll from uh, Florida Tech, uh, who is a human factors expert, drill down even more to talk about how this perception way into even beyond the question specifically of whether, you know, how, how does human perception uh, play into it? So I know we're about 10 minutes, I think, ahead, but I think this is, is valuable to kind of get us started early and, and work. So, um, Ian, are you on the line? Yes, I am. All right, perfect. And I think we've swapped over to your deck, so I will hand it over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I must apologize if you hear some noise in the background. It's uh, Someone is mowing the lawn, and I, I don't have any control over that. Even if I close the windows, you probably still hear it. So um, myself and my colleague, Dr. Carroll, um, we're going to present some slides on the, uh, looking at the human side of it. So can we go to the next slide, please? So here's the problem. As you notice in, in, on this slide here, the accident rates, um, weather-related accident rates, um, that started from 2010 all the way to 2019. And this information was pulled from the null report, which is AOP report. And I, I know some of you are probably cognizance of this type of reporting. They actually pulled information from the NTSB database and then put it into this format. And so, as you can see, the accident rates are still high when it comes to VFR and IMC. So there is a problem. Next slide, please. And to answer the question, yes, Alaska is included in here because this report is, is comprehensive. So this slide here shows you pilot certification. So, you know, when we look at accidents, you know, we first ask, well, you know, how qualified was the pilot? And it, it actually shows you here that it doesn't matter what qualifications the pilot has, whether he's an IFR rated pilot or he holds an ATP, um, they're still they're still caught up in, 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 in these accidents. Uh, so it is a problem. And then the slide to the right, I, I throw that in there for good measure because if you notice that weather is really um, listed there and it's a high percentage, so I thought it was very important to show this to the audience. Next slide, please. And um, because the weather technology in the cockpit program, we are looking at helicopter operations. I'm sure most of you are pretty much aware that these are high risk operations that, are, that pilots fly almost every day, uh, different types of the, um, the day and night. And, um, you know, these accidents are occurring at a very high rate. And even though the, the lives that are lost are minimum, it's still a problem. So I thought I'd put this in here. And if you notice where it says loss of control, which is the highest on this chart. Now, loss of control could be many things, but, you know, it could also be, you know, related to weather. So that's the reason why I put this up there. Next slide, please. So. What are some of the factors contributing to these weather-related accidents? So uh, thanks to Ember Riddle, uh, funded by the, the WIDIP program, they conducted a study, um, I think it was in 2012, 2013, 
uh, time frame where they in, um, looked at, you know, various pilots, GA pilots. Um, they they used, they first used um, pilots from Emeritus Lernaka University, and then you know, they went out into the public domain where they can get pilots. Now, it is assumed that if you attend a university and you did a, a collegiate program, that your knowledge should be a little more superior to a guy who just went to an FBO. And I'm not knocking FBOs because I also did my, some of my training at FBOs. But um, a university would have a more structured um, program. So we would hope that the students coming out of that program will have a little more weather knowledge. But of course, for the next few slides, you will see, but just to list a few of the things there, and I'm, I'm not going to read all of them, but the first bullet there talks about lack of weather knowledge and skills. Um, next slide, please. So this was the, um, the study that was done. And um, Let's go to the next slide, please. So they looked at 204 pilots, as I said, um, in, for this study, and you see they break them down in, in, in terms of certification or, or experience. And <laughs> here are the scores, right? So the overall GA uh, weather knowledge scores, you can see that there, and uh, most of you who are pilots in the room or have knowledge of the written exam, you have to have 70% to pass. So nobody scored 70. Next slide. And the next few slides just show the various areas. So I'm not going to read all of these, but the, these are the you know things like thunderstorms um, and how pilots actually performed. And you notice that in most of these areas, they didn't even score a 70. Next slide. This year, we look at uh, the various weather products, how they interpret that information, and there are the scores again. And then they look, also looked at automated products versus traditional generated products, and there are the scores again. Now, th th they have a comprehensive report, and so if anyone is interested in, in looking at this report, um, please feel free to shoot me an email or, or talk to Gary and we can send it to you. But in the essence of time, I just use these slides um, to, to, you know, to make not to, uh, get the point over. Next slide, please. So the weather technology in the cockpit um, did a study, and basically what we what we were looking at, there are a lot of weather applications out there from various vendors, and from human factor standpoint, each of these vendors display that information differently. And so this was a study where we looked at three different products or three different presentations. And we found that, you know, depending on the, the symbology, you know, that you and the colors that you put, pilots perceive that information differently. And there, there's also a, a report on that that anyone can look at. Then we look at the um, symbolic symbology salience, you know, how bright is it? Um, if it's brighter, the pilots see it better. Um, if it's not, then they have an issue recognizing what it is. And then after we found out that pilots were not seeing once this, um, their airport changed from VFR to IFR via symbology, we decided, well, can we find another way to inform the pilot or get their attention? Now, we use the word notification. We stay away from the word alert. So we tried using a, a bracelet which would get, um, would vibrate when the symbol on the display changed. So they're getting a visual as well as a tactile um, from, the, from the bracelet. And so they were able to basically have some knowledge or be cognizant when something changed. That helped a lot, but we still need to get the vibration where we need to be. Next slide, please. So I'll turn this over now to Dr. Carroll, and she will talk about perception and why it's important. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Hi, can you guys hear me OK? Can 
Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Good, good, good. I always like to check with teams. My name is Meredith Carroll. I'm a professor in the College of Aeronautics at Florida Tech down in Melbourne, Florida. Um, I know some of you are probably familiar with my colleagues, um, Dr. Debbie Carstens, Mike Split, um, Steve Cusick used to work on, I think, some of the weather projects. Um, I run a lab, the Atlas Lab, which is a um, human factors lab, and we have studied pilot decision making, you know, in several different contexts. And so Ian asked me just to kind of provide a background on how the perceptual process comes into play. Um, so I'm not an expert on weather products. You know, we've studied how pilots make decisions with some of them. So uh, bear with me with respect to that. Um, so perception is funny. I um, mean, you know, all people say oh, perception is reality. Um, but in truth, perception is a very subjective thing, right? So what one person sees and interprets in a certain way, other people might see and interpret in totally different ways. And so it's something we have to keep in mind, especially when we're designing um, products for, for, users to, for users to make decisions based off of. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is Wiccan's human information processing model. I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with this. Um, but I kind of just wanted to use it to make a point about how important perception is, right? So if you see in this model, we process sensory information that comes in through, through our senses, you know, auditory cues, uh, visual cues, proprioceptive cues, et cetera. And before we can make a decision based on it, it goes through this perception process in, in, in which we assign it meaning. So if you can click forward, there's just a little automation to kind of illustrate that, right? So um, the raw information, these water, weather products that are being developed are only as good as a pilot can interpret them effectively, right? So it's something we really need to consider in designing and then preparing them. So through training to ensure that they are interpreting the weather products as they were intended to be used. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is actually something I teach in some of my classes. So our perception is, is influenced by two types of processes. One is top down, I always say kind of, you know, to help them remember from the head. So we interpret things based on our knowledge, our past experience, mental models we have, right? And so the biggest way to influence this is through training, right? So, so having us know, kind of be prepared for what to, how to interpret things that are coming down the pipe. But we also are then, this perceptual process is influenced by bottom up processes. So, I always tell the students, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So you have to have good information coming in, right? There has to be, the products need to be legible, readable, um, you know, interpretable, so to speak. The, the symbology has to have meaning, there can't be too much color. So there's a lot you need to do with respect to design to ensure that not only are they prepared to interpret it, but that the products are interpretable themselves. So if you go to the next slide, I kind of applied this to, to kind of the weather information um, domain. So. Um, some of the important top-down influences are knowledge of how the weather phenomena influence flight safety, right? So, and past experience with this as well. So, if, if, if you know, a pilot is, is, has flown a lot in thunderstorms or has flown a lot in icing conditions, you know, they're going to have experiences that, that are going to influence how they interpret and make decisions based on the weather information that's being provided. Um, another important thing is just their, their mental model of, of how, how those weather sources get their information, how recent they are, um, how accurate they are, um, you know, when to kind of trust them and why. We did a study a few years ago that was funded um, by ANGC1 looking at pilot decision making with conflicting information. We surveyed over 100 pilots, generally aviation pilots, um, corporate pilots, airline pilots, and I mean there's a wide range of weather products that were utilized and oftentimes they encountered weather products that um, presented two different kind of pictures, right? And the reason for the different information was usually, you know, they were either didn't have the same recency or that each of the weather products have strengths and weaknesses. There's some times when certain weather products are going to be kind of more trustworthy at a certain point in time than others. So it's it's kind of critical for pilots to understand, you know, when when do I use which products and when can I trust the information in, in each weather product. Um, and so the best way to, to, to kind of deal with this is through training, right? Pilots need to ensure that they have further on training on whether phenomenon impacts on flight. And I think that's, you know, a big, there's a big push for that, especially like the flight training at Florida Tech. But something that there isn't is necessarily training on how do you interpret these weather sources? And when do you trust which weather sources at certain points in time? What are their strengths and weaknesses? So that's, um, you know, the study that Ian showed is kind of illustrates it. So, so this looked across different types of pilot and found in all cases that um, they really were, were did a poor job at interpreting the weather sources, right? So um, part of that is training to ensure they know how to interpret them. With respect to the bottom-up influences, you know, what are the environmental cues they're using? So they can look out the windscreen, 
um, you know, they can feel the turbulence. They, they're communicating with ATC and, you know, getting pirates from other pi pilots. Um, but they, again, they have this like myriad of different weather information sources that they're looking at to try and figure out what is ground truth. Um, so ensuring that, that those are designed in a way that pilots can easily interpret them. I heard someone, you know, when we were preparing for this thing, you know, a lot of the products are designed by meteorologists. Uh, for meteorologists, right? So, so pilots have very different, um, not just you know mental models of how things work, but also goals. And I teach a, a kind of an interface design course, and I always say, you know, you've got to start with the user. And so, having pilots kind of involved in the design of these weather sources can be very helpful, right? So, I'm sorry. Now I've got a blower in my background. If you hear that, <laughs> someone's doing their long here. Um, but ensuring that you're thinking about the piloting task and designing the product such that they're given the information they need when they need it, and information that they don't need, maybe there's a way to declutter it, right? Because anything that's not presented at the time that they're making decisions kind of becomes a distractor. Um, so those are kind of the two kind of two big influences of perceptions. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, something else that, you know, we, that, that we need to think about is, is risk, right? So the perception of risk. That this, um, you know, there's typically, you know, we think of this with respect to, you know, how likely it is to happen and the impact. And this too is influenced by pilot's past experiences um, and, and kind of the risk propensity. So, so each of us have individual differences and in sort of how much risk we're willing to take. Um, this influences how risky a situation we is and in turn, you know, how safe a decision we're going to make. Um, there's a lot of different factors that influence the risk perception. We have them just as different situations, so cognitive factors. You know, is it? Do we even have the have have the the attention available to really consider the risk? Are we? Is the workload too high? Are we under too much stress that we're not really able to consider it? You know, emotional factors. But kind of the big places I think that that we can have an influence are the contextual and individual factors. And if you go to the next slide, you know, it really focuses on you know design of the information sources. Um, so, you know, are the sources being designed with the pilot in mind for the piloting task? Um, and then training. So making sure not just that they're being trained on, on weather, on the weather and how weather impacts flight safety, but on how to use the product. Like, what are the different, what are the different symbology means? We, you know, we have, what, what is the, re, how, you know, what is the update rate? When, when is it most appropriate to utilize these, pro, these products and when are they going to provide you the information you need to make the decision? Um, and so I think, you know, it was really interesting, the Ember Riddle study showing just such a need for um, them to have some level of training and, and you know, to, and to maybe work on the interpretability of the weather products. Because right now, you know, there's evidence to show that the pilots just, they, they, they don't know how to interpret them correctly. And so their perceptions, which is, again, the cornerstone of good decision, decision making, aren't necessary, necessarily accurately reflecting, you know, the ground truth of, of the weather around them. So I think with the next slide, I'm going to throw it back to Ian. Okay, back to you, Ian. Thank you, Carol. So, so to build on what Dr. Carol uh, mentioned earlier uh, about perception, as human beings, we perceive things differently. Um, you know, you and I may see something, and when we relate that information, how we process that information, it could be totally different the way we relate it or interpret that information. And so we need to find a way to help pilots to interpret information in a manner that they're able to inform their decisions. Um, with regards to risk, there are, there are several tools that are available to pilots, you know, to help identify risk, assess, assess the risk, and even mitigate the risk. And, you know, I personally, as a pilot, um, I think sometimes it's a personal responsibility for pilots because the information is out there. Um, there are aviation webinars that are out there that pilots can actually participate participate in and gain that knowledge to help the sharpener enhance their skills. These are just a few um, tools that are available to pilots. And all this information is found in, found in the Risk Management Handbook, which is a handbook published by the FAA, and it's free to pilots. That's where I got that information from. So the first one, we want to look at the PAVE model, right? And, and, and basically, in, in this model here, you know, the pilot looks at everything on this model before he or she decides whether or not they should actually make the flight. 
So it covers, you know, the pilot, you know, the aircraft, the environment, and any, you know, external pressures. So one external pressure um, pilots may need to consider is could be passenger pressure. So, you know, your, your general aviation pilot, you have a friend that maybe you, you, that friend want you to take them somewhere and, you know, they want to get there like yesterday. And so you could be pressured as a pilot to, to make that decision just based on passenger um, pressure. There are some studies out there that talk about passenger pressure. Um, time is also a factor. You know, there's a saying when you're running late, you do make mistakes or you forget things. And, you know, that could happen. So you need to be cognizant of that. Then you have I'm safe checklists. And, you know, there are a list of things in there that pilots need to look at. You know, if, for instance, if you're on some type of medication, um, if you just got off of work and, um, you know, you're stressed out, you probably want to wait maybe an, not a day or so to make that flight. And then, of course, we have um, the risk assessment um, where you look at whether the risk is high or low. And then to the, to the, to the extreme right, there's another risk assessment um, form that pilots can use. But when I, when I selected this form, I noticed on the form that it doesn't cover the entire flight. If you notice, it says weather at termination. So one of the things we stressed on in the WIDIC program when we have these webinars with pilots or in flight instructors, we normally emphasize that as a pilot, you need to plan the entire flight. Look at it holistically. But what we found out from some of our research, pilots were just looking at their um, departure point and the destination point and everything in between, they're not focusing on or not, in, you know, they're not including that in their pre-flight planning. And so when something pops up during the flight, now, you know, if you didn't plan for it, there's obviously you wouldn't know what to do. And then in the middle where it says mitigating the risk, these are just some of the things that you can do. You know, you can wait until the weather is VFR, which sometimes people don't want to do that. Or you can take an IFR pilot. And I, I, play, <laughs> I put in there current and IFR proficient, because there's a difference. I may have an IFR rating, but I'm not a current IFR pilot, or I'm not current, or I'm not even proficient. So I may not be a good pilot if you want a VFR pilot would want to take along for that ride. Of course, you can cancel the flight, and then if it's possible, maybe you can consider driving. Next slide, please. Here we have, have um, there, there are a bunch of decision um, making or aeronautical decision making tools that are available to pilots. And I just choose to use this one. We call it the tree pre model. And, and going with the team, you know, the um, Dr. Carroll talked about the, about perception. Um, the tree P basically say states that you perceive. So the pilot perceived the hazard. Then it, that individual process it, uh, or you know, evaluating the level of risk, you know, and looking at alternatives. And then once that is done, you decide to perform. How are you going to mitigate it? Or are you going to eliminate the risk? And then I found this here in an IFR magazine that I subscribe to. And what I liked about this, they basically put everything together, which has a very good caption. And so when it talks about perceive, it looks at the various things. It has the PAVE model in there. And then when it looks at processing, it talks about the care, which is consequences, alternatives, reality, and external pressures. I notice external pressures keep coming up. So it's obviously it's important. That's why they're placing a lot of emphasis in it. Then, of course, perform you know, in terms of the risk, that's the team. So you transfer, eliminate, accept, or mitigate. And like I said, this information is found in the risk management handbook, which is published by the FAA. And so, you know, most pilots should have an issue trying to find this information. Next slide, please. So the weather technology and the cockpit team did a study on the VNR. Um, VFR not required. Um, that's a statement that is issued when the weather is not VFR and most um, 
folks on the flight service station um, who, who might be in the room are pretty cognizant of that statement. So we did a study and we used some scenarios. Um, and what, what we found out, I don't have the, I think I listed this description as, yeah, description of the scenario. But the results we found out, uh, the first study we did, we had um, pilots as well as, as well as flight service station specialists, because we wanted to see, well, what's the difference in the way they make that decision? Um, pilots might be more conservative or are the flight service uh, specialists more conservative? And so we, we had eight scenarios and on one of the scenarios, there was a wide variety. They all looked at the same weather information, but they all made different decisions based on whether it was VFR or VNR. And the the, the little results at the bottom there would, would show you how the how the how the between the pilots and the flight service specialists um, made their decisions based on that scenario, looking at the same information. To the right, that, that was our second study. And basically, um, for those here who might be human factors in the room, this is just a prototype display. It's not something that is out there already. But we designed this to, um, to basically do the research. And what is good about this is that you have your flight path laid on, on the sectional chart. And then you have the weather products on the right that you can select. And once you select the weather products, it will show on the on your chart whether those airports or VFR, IFR, or whether you can make the flight or not. And it's a no brainer um, for you to use that, for pilots to use that. And then below, you'll see the results here. So, I guess the point we can take away from this, at some point in time, flight service is thinking about automated, automated VFR, VNR. And, you know, because going back to what Marriott said, Marriott said um, about perception and the way we perceive stuff, they'll have to take into consideration, you know, the, var the variation of pilots, the, the, the skill sets and, you know, culture is also a big part before they can automate it. So in a nutshell, they may be able to automate certain things, but they may not be able to automate it fully. So that's just some of the takeaways from here. Next slide, please. We also use this, um, it's a modified um, flight risk assessment tool, which was developed by the FAA. And um, what we did, we added the weather products to it. So it, the, the old tool did not have the weather products. So we added the weather products to help the pilots to in, help with their decision-making process. So they were able to look at the weather products and score them um, and you know, with their personal minimum checklist to decide whether or not I should, I'm VFR or I'm sh I should just cancel the flight. Um, there's a report that came out of this study. And if anyone is interested in viewing the report, please let me know or Gary, and we can send you the report. Next slide, please. So to summarize this, you know, um, addressing the gaps, it's obviously that adverse weather remains a major cause of general aviation accidents. Major contribution factors in weather related accidents, maybe pilot, lack of weather knowledge, their inability to interpret weather displays. Um, addressing these gaps um, increase the um, interpretability and usability of weather products. Design based on mental models of users. Um, and I think Joel might have mentioned this early, earlier, that pilots are not meteorologists and most of the products out there are designed for meteorologists. Focus on products, on products and what, what users need to know to make effective decisions. And we need to develop more targeted weather training, focused on how to interpret weather products, experience, inter experience, in experience interpreting weather information, 
in various situations. So in a, it basically in a nutshell, we need to do a better job, um, both in designing where, in the way we design weather products for pilots. Um, I think we need to include pilots in the design. Um, Marriott, Marriott, I'm sure would, um, would agree with me, being the three two human factors individuals, that you need to bring the pilots into the development process. Or you just don't de design the products and then throw it out there and expect the pilots to use it. We need to ensure that we include the pilots in, in how we develop these products. And, you know, the product should be simple to interpret uh, because we have to remember that as pilots, you know, our role for us is aviate, navigate, and communicate. And you're juggling a lot of stuff while you're in the cockpit. And from a GS standpoint, you have a single pilot operation. So you don't have another individual that can you can share the task with. And so we need to be cognizant of that when we're developing these products. Um, with respect to training, we need to do a better job training pilots. Um, most of the, the technologies that you know the, disseminate wet information, like the garments, the Avidine, um displays, most of the training is, on, training is based on the botanology and not on actually how to use the products. Um, so we need to do a better job at that. I think we also need to include some more training in terms of weather. For instance, like when pilots are doing their buy-in and flight review, there should be a weather piece in there to test pilots on years to see, you know, are they still sharp and the skills in weather is still sharp or not. And then we try to communicate to pilots when we go out to these webinars that, you know, if you know you're weak in a certain area, for instance, in wet, like weather, then you want to get with your instructor. And so you can brush up on that. But then we also need to continue communicating to the instructors and, and trying to show them the gaps in knowledge from our research so that they can target those gaps when they're training their pilots. And so I'll turn it back over to Jewel and the panel. And if there are any questions, I'm available to answer them. Thank you. Great, thank you both so much. Uh, so we have about eight minutes. I know I know we stand between everybody and refilling their coffee, but um, are there any questions on the chat? I have a couple of questions, but want to see if either anybody in person or Gary. Gary, 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 Gary. Um, uh, Dr. Carroll, I'm just curious. Um, you had a chart of this looks like a flow chart, and it really struck me when I looked at it. You have on there long term memory, but nowhere did you put short term memory on that chart. And I didn't know if it's picked up somewhere else because I always think a short term memory is overriding and as one of the issues, even with learning and perception, is something that happens really near term. You tend to remember, and I'm not even thinking just weather, even like a, when you see a closing pitcher, if he misses a strike zone twice, he loses confidence in his fastball, even though he may hit it, you know, 98% of the time, he just remembers, oh, I'm missing it. Where does short-term memory fall into that decision model you showed, or how do you teach that when you're talking about perception? Okay, can we go back to that slide? That was the second slide. Okay, so here you go. So another term for short-term memory is working memory. So, so, and working memory or short-term memory, it's really, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a memory store, but it's also kind of a workbench, right? So it's a place where as you're taking in information from the environment, you put that on this workbench, you might grab some memories from your long-term memory. And this, this workbench is where you kind of like make the decision happen if you have to interpret information. So I think what you're getting at is this is limited capacity, right? So there's only so much that this table can hold. So as you're taking things in and making, making, making decisions and manipulating this information in your working memory, we have to be cognizant that there's a limited capacity. And so the easier things are to, the, the simpler the information is and the easier it is to hold in that short-term memory store in your working memory, um, the less of a memory load it's gonna be and the better able you're gonna be able to be to make accurate decisions. Does that get at what you're asking about? Uh, that's that's a good explanation. Thank you. And, and Gary, if I may add to what um, Dr. Carroll just said, um, pilots actually use their short-term memory or working memory um, to memorize stuff like um, engine out checklists, landing checklists. You know, most of those things are memorized by pilots. 
um, and they store that in their short term memory. So it's, you know, if they do it in long term, then they have to retrieve it. So, um, and, and with rehearsal, you can store more in your short term memory. But if the if the information is too complex, then it gets more difficult to store it in, in that type of situation. Yeah, I also think a short term and working sometimes is where bad habits. If you skip your checklist a couple of times and you have no problems, you start to remember, hey, I don't really need it. And you can get lazy yeah. on things. Or like I said, so that's why I was curious whether working memory would act, could actually override long term, you know. And that's where sometimes where we look at this adaptive behavior that we're starting to look at in Wittick to see whether that helps, um, you know, with some of these dis RPD training and other adaptive behavior so that you don't let that short term memory override your long term. Well, and I think. Yeah. So and, and go, go ahead. ahead Meredith. Yeah, um, and it also goes back to use it or lose it. Right. So. Um, if, if you don't use that information on a regular basis, then it's obviously bits and pieces are going to, you're going to lose bits and pieces. So, you know, that's why pilots need to constantly focus on being, continue to being shot by training. And, you know, we do a lot of memorization um, as pilots because there's a lot going on, especially, you know, if you have a complex system that you're working with. Um, but yeah, I, I think we should um, look at that on the WIDIC program. Yeah, what I was going to say is just that, so we call that bad feedback, right? So when you make a bad decision, things should go poorly for you, right? But that's not how the world works. We live in a world of probabilities where sometimes you can make a really dumb decision and it works out. And if that happens multiple times, I think you kind of this association, like that goes in the, oh, good decision category, even though it was a bad decision. And this is why training is so important, right? Because in a training situation, you can control those outcomes, right? So when you train them in various weather situations, when they make a bad decision, you need to ensure that the feedback highlights what are the negative outcomes that could potentially happen if you make these bad decisions. And all that is actually stored in long-term memory, right? So working memory is a, is a workbench. It's a place where you like access those long-term memories. So it's kind of like, you know, think of it as like, your, you know, part of it is your central executive, right? So it's like the computer that runs everything. So, but it is very important to kind of ensure that the associations you're building in those long-term memories actually kind of tie good decisions to good outcomes and bad decisions to bad outcomes. Well, if I can, and if I, I can add to that as well, that's one of the reasons why standard operating procedure is imperative. Absolutely. Because it reduces with, the- I agree with you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna jump in here no, and-, and try and move the conversation. I, we've only got a few minutes left and I, we've got a few questions here in the room and online. So I wanted to let Michael Split go ahead and ask his question. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, I'm just scared about teaching my students more information. They already think it's an absurd amount of information in terms of those advisories, but <laughs> apparently they need more. But here's my question probabilistic information is becoming like a big thing in meteorology. How do we convey probabilistic information? And I wonder if y'all could comment on human perception of probability as meteorologists are moving forward with all these probabilistic products. So they've actually done a few studies to look at a few different techniques. Um, and so one is, you know, numerical, but they've also done things like where they change like the opacity of the information, right? So like the lighter it is, the less trustworthy it is, or the darker it is. Um, you can do it kind of with colors too. And they find that sometimes that kind of facilitates ease of interpretation. Um, so it depends on the type of data, but that's kind of one way that they've shown that, that it can be conveyed effectively. Yeah, and, and to add to what Dr. Carr said too, but we, we have to be very careful when we're doing that because, you know, like I, we talked earlier about perception, um, 50 percent probability of something to one person means something totally different to another individual. And, and so it, it, we have to be very careful how we do that. Um, the other thing about that, you know, I don't want to embarrass anyone who is a pilot, but pilots are not going to sit down and calculate stuff or look at too many numbers to make a decision. You know, so we, we need to ensure that whatever we come up with, you know, we test it and, you know, by doing research and show that, you know, we, we, we work out everything, you know, what are, what are some of the weaknesses in, in using either numerical information, 
compared to if we just use a graphic to show, well, okay, here, here's the wet information and you either put, you know, include the, the flight categories like VFR, IFR, or something that pilots are used to seeing. So if I see that an airport is VFR, I know, or the wet is VFR, yes, I can make that flight. But then if it's, say, if it's saying to me, well, there's 50% or 40% probability that the weather is going to be VFR, you know, that that can lead to a lot of problems. So we just got to be very careful. Thanks. Yeah, but I think it is important because, you know, one of the things we found when we were looking at the, the decision making with conflicting information is, you know, there's there's certain times when you should be looking when one product or one source of information is more accurate or more timely than another. And we kind of toyed with the idea of like, could we have like a trustworthiness indicator? Because at any point in time, pilots have to look at all these sources and if they're saying different things like, so which one should I be focused on at this point in time? So I think providing that kind of probabilistic information in the form of kind of like integrity of an information source at certain points in time could be helpful as well. I do want to have one last question. Uh, David, did I see in the room here? Somebody had a question. Okay, yes. Thank you for this research. Um, it's very fascinating. I think we've all seen situations where you hand over the perfect weather forecast and there's still decisions that are made and sometimes they're not good ones. So I think this is a really important aspect for us to look at. Um, one thing that I'm wondering specifically is if you've looked at or researched confirmation bias. Um, anecdotally, I've seen that happen a lot. That's where your weather shopping happens. A uh, pilot will look for the information that confirms that they can go. So has, has that been a part of this research at all? So I haven't conducted any from research. A from, a, no, from a Wittig standpoint, we have not done that, but that's something we probably could do because I think it's very important. I mean, that that happens not just in the general aviation world, but it also happens in the 121 and 135. I, I've seen accidents where confirmation bias played a role um, in the accident. So I think it's important that we need to probably look at that too. So that's a very good um, suggestion. And if you remember, we inadvertently you. did that. It was kind of interesting in a study that wasn't related, but um, where um, we gave the um, next rad to po at 121 pilots with their forward looking radar. And we kind of just assumed when we were running this experiment, it really had nothing to do with it, that they'd know that the forward looking radar is more accurate. But they actually ended up, it was amazing. They kept trying to reconcile the two because of the delay. And they ended up in this experiment. It sort of ruined the experiment a little because we just assumed they'd know if we were looking radars real time, just use it. But it bothered them, even though they were different views, different latency. And we actually saw that and it messed up the timing and the parameter we were doing. So it's not, it wasn't a formal experiment like Ian said, but we were really surprised. And that's sort of what you're saying that sometimes different sources can make you perceive or just not act the way you think, even though you should know trust one and ignore the other. And that was a prime example. We were really kind of surprised at how much delay that caused. Yeah, and, and another thing, if, for instance, if the hey, pilot Ian, is cognizant. Is, is Ian, hold, hold on one second. I've got Marilyn who, who's wanting to, to speak here. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. If I could comment on that from a perspective of, of being a flight instructor for a really long time and then having been with the FAA an accident investigator uh, as part of my required duties. Um, what I saw with pilots, whether they were experienced or not experienced, IFR, VFR, is shopping around for what worked for them. If they really wanted to make a flight, they would look at two or three different weather sources until they got the one that showed them that the flight could be accomplished successfully. So I think there's a problem in interpreting weather and using varieties of sources that may use different um, uh, visualizations and colors and and how they, uh, you know, the latency of the forecast or the report or, or whatever. So, you know, there's that shopping around even if you provide the pilot with the information, even if the pilot is weather savvy, they're still going to shop around for what they want and make that go, no go decision. And it's a go when it should be a no go. And I think one thing that could be done too is so confirmation bias, this is like prevalent across 
all, many domains, not just aviation, but so like awareness training of these biases, could that be incorporated into training that, hey, this is something we see pilots doing, you know, be aware that, you know, if you're looking for a certain, you know, for a certain outcome, you know, be sure to look at the pros and the cons, you know, those that support it and, and, and don't, you know, to kind of overcome this confirmation bias. Yeah, and the Great last conversation thing I, here. I, wanna say, I just want to say one last thing, Jewel. Um, the, the, if the pilots are um, familiar with that location that they fly into on a regular basis and they're familiar with some of the weather phenomena in that area, they tend to also take that into consideration when they're making a decision. So we just need to ensure that we, when, when we talk to pilots, we need to ensure, let them know that one, you know, weather is very dynamic and what you see yesterday may not be the same weather you see tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks again, Ian and Dr. Carroll. Um, so I know we've still got a couple of questions in the room and a couple of questions online. I would like to invite you to please, uh, as Brian says in the chat, please post those uh, questions. If you have them directly, I have contact information for both Dr. Johnson and Dr. Carroll. Um, but I think we're slated for a 10 minute up down right now for a break. Um, we're going to honor that even though we ran over. So if you could, please be back by 946, 945, if preferable, please. Um, if you have to use the facilities, I believe the men's room is out this way. Am I correct in assuming that the women's is out this way? Correct. And um, and on your way in or out, please swing by the side table here and pick up your what your weather is nominal button. Okay, Matt, are we back online on the uh, on the chat? Are we able to go ahead and jump in? Okay, so for the next portion here, we're going to go ahead and jump into teaching the right information the right way. And so I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to my 121 colleagues to my left and let them go ahead and take the first little bit here. All right, thanks, Joel. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a chance to replenish your coffee and whatever else you needed. Um, so that was a great discussion earlier, a lot of talk about different decision making and uh, what are we required to know, what are we not um, from the 121, 91, and 135. So I'm gonna jump into a little bit of the 121 side. And, you know, I mentioned earlier what meteorology information is enough practical knowledge to make a good safe decision now ian talked a lot about um personal minimums and risk factors that the pilot needs to go through but in all honesty in the 121 world we're going to go regardless there's a lot of pressures in the 121 world to go. We are now a society that we want it now. We want our package delivered in 10 minutes if we could, or maybe the next day. Um, we want that cargo carrier to go. We want the cargo to be loaded underneath the bellies of a passenger aircraft, and we want to safely deliver all that's in the airplane, whether it be 185 people plus packages or just packages. And we want to do it in a safe manner. Um, and I can guarantee you that the pilots are going through both from our AOM, our flight manuals, and also our personal minimums and decisions. But in all honesty, the plane's going to go. Um, whether we have to wait out a few minutes, half hour for a thunderstorm or God forbid, a snowstorm that shuts down the whole Northeast or, you know, but there are certain economic uh, and other pressures to take that plane from its origin to its destination. Now, yes, we have certain requirements that we have to follow for initial and recurrent training. And I can tell you that in the 121 world, that is a large spectrum of what a carrier does for initial and recurrent training. I may sit in a classroom that's uh, taught by 
both meteorology and dispatch from a carrier like United, or I might have to sit in front of a computer with a CBT and go through and meet that same requirement. Now, is it better training to sit in a classroom and be taught by a meteorologist or uh, a combination of dispatch and meteorology versus getting it from a CBT? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. And we talked a lot about and heard uh, from the human factor side, how are we as pilots interpreting that information? How are we interpreting that training? Is it enough? Do I have certain questions? I can guarantee you that, um, and I'll share my age a little bit, along with uh, Marilyn and some of the other pilots that have spoken in the room, we remember getting face-to-face -face briefings. I like those face-to-face -face briefings. I can hear what they're saying, look at what they're telling me. I can look at their body language and read their body language. Um, Bruce remembers walking into a flight service station years ago and getting that briefing before he jumps in. Probably wasn't his Saratoga then, but uh, jumps in the airplane. And you can really make an informed decision by receiving that information. We have a lot younger crowd sitting in the front end of a 121. They learn differently. Um, I know that from my adult kids. They learn differently. Um, they fly the airplane differently than we did 30 years ago, but we still have to fly that airplane in the, in the bounds that the regulations and the carrier that we fly for has us do. Um, but what is enough training? in the initial and the recurrent. Some carriers will provide recurrent training that's a CBT now delivered on my iPad that only is talking about my airborne radar. And that's their version of my recurrent training. Is that enough? The regulations say I have to know about icing products, convection products, other type of meteorological information and phenomena that I can make an informed decision on. But is that enough? Had an interesting conversation with somebody at the break. Maybe that information should be interpreted for me. Bruce talked about that yesterday in, in when we were talking about the questions on the meteorological section of the tests that pilots have to take that I keep hearing they can flunk all of and still pass. Um, should that information be changed to a decision aid for the pilot? You know, maybe a green red light, go, no go type of information versus a raw METAR or, you know, TAF or GFA or whatever the product is, you know? Um, my personal opinion is it's got to be trained differently to who you're training, what it, what, what, and who is your audience. So I'll turn it over to Captain Eden just to wrap up the 121 pilot side, and then uh, Debbie will follow up with the uh, dispatcher side. So, Mark, over to you. Well, I would agree with you 100. percent A lot of it depends on what your audience is, because I, I fly both general aviation. Uh, on my time off, and I fly obviously 121 is my career, and the the weather knowledge that I need to use and use uh, is is sometimes quite significantly different, uh, because as you so astutely pointed out, that in this day and age, in the 121 operation, it's not so much a go no go decision anymore, because the decision is go, you're going one way or the other, and we've got aircraft now that are basically all weather capable. The only things that, you know, that really concern me, you know, weather wise in the 121 environment are thunderstorms and, um, uh, of course, you know, convective weather. Uh, icing pretty much is not much of an issue anymore, although it could be depending on what uh, MELs I may be dispatched with. But for the most part, you know, it's it's the 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 idea is that you're you're going to be going. You may be delayed for just a little bit. Uh, while you wait for the uh, uh, the departure gate to open up. <clears throat> uh, but on the other hand, you know, for the, uh, and 
uh, for the general aviation pilot, that's the you, you, you as we again have pointed out, previous speakers have pointed out, that's a whole different uh, whole different arena and a different ball game completely. Um, so the most of the decision making you know uh, process there falls you know squarely on my shoulders on a daily basis. And a lot of that's going to de depend on you know my experience level that I have, as we again have astutely pointed out. But going back to the training piece of it, um, you know, I've spent, I've been the director of training and standards at three different 121 carriers, and my theory is probably a little bit different. You know, my my idea is is that I don't expect a pilot, any one of my pilots, you know, to know anything that I didn't teach them. And so what I mean by that is that it's my responsibility to determine uh, what is enough meteorology to ensure a practical knowledge of weather phenomena, including the principles of frontal systems it's spelled out in 419. Uh, it's not necessarily, I don't necessarily expect them to spend, you know, every waking moment, you know, of their time off out there looking for meteorology information. Or let's say, for example, weight and balance. By the way, you can miss all the weight and balance questions also and pass the uh, exam as well. So it's not just weather. So again, you know, our approach to all of this is going to be dependent on, you know, what, what, what we're actually trying to do and what kind of operation we're conducting. As far as recurrent training is concerned, it's kind of the same thing. Um, uh, most, almost everyone that I know of has gone to. Uh, CBT type format in the uh, in the air carrier world uh, for teaching you know recurrent weather subjects, and again those are spelled out in 427 uh, or 121 427 in the case of the 121 operators. So you know it's going to be up to us to kind of determine that, and it's and it's kind of you know um, I guess it's between the the training folks at the individual carriers. And it's it is the carrier's responsibility to determine you know what is enough meteorology information, uh, and it's an agreement or a handshake then between them and the principal operations inspector. Back to you guys. Any questions? I I have a comment in regards of something you said for the general aviation. There are people out there that translate the information. That's what flight service does. They have someone they can call. They can provide all the data and actually interpret what it says, what it's supposed to mean. But at the end of the day, the pilot needs to know still what does that mean? Because as a pilot, I have to make the decision. A flight service specialist does not make a decision. Unlike for one part 121, you always go for general aviation. It's not the same. On the other hand, as you also mentioned, the way that pilots that are training today, how they learn differently, it's not just how they learn, it's how they interact. You said you love going into a flight service station back in the day and talking to someone, even if that was a service that was available in the CONUS today, I highly doubt anybody would go into a flight service station. People don't wanna interact face to face. They barely wanna talk to each other on the phone. I mean, we've been a program shrinking for years because people don't want to talk to each other. Uh, there are other ways, and we're exploring other ways of talking via text or via email and the, all that. But there are resources out there. It's just a matter of, as instructors, what do you teach your students? What are their resources and how to use them, whether you like to talk to someone or not? Maybe if you don't understand what you're saying, you should be talking to a flight service specialist and actually getting the information translated for you, but you still have to know how to make a decision based on the information you're given. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I agree with you. I think you hit, I, I, I hit on a very good point too. And I think that a lot of this is largely generational and the way that newer generations obtain their information. I'm like Mark. I learned a tremendous amount of, of weather knowledge from interacting with uh, the uh, the meteorologists and the briefings that I was given because I could ask them questions and I continued to learn as I as I progressed in my career. It was not just something that was taught at the beginning of my career and, uh, and then that was the end of it, which is kind of the way it is now, unfortunately. And frankly, you know, uh, a lot of the learning, you know, in, at least in the in the operator environment occurs in the cockpit. 
you know, where the, the older pilots are passing along information. But now in the current environment where I've got, you know, from zero to hero in less than five years, and I've got a guy that's, uh, or a gal that's in the, that's progressing to the, you know, to the command position, you know, in less than five years from the time they took their first flying lesson, it's, it's just not the same world that it used to be. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we have a couple more questions in the room. We'll go here first and then back there. Yeah, so uh, Jim from AOPA, I just, you know, I was talking to Marilyn about this a little bit yesterday after the, after the uh, briefings yesterday, um, and I'm just wondering what, to what degree there has been outreach done um, from, um, from, from you folks to the electronic flight bag providers, namely for flight Garmin, um, to see what things they could possibly change or, or improve in their products. I think you know, they do a pretty good job uh, already of the, the, the products that they present, but in many cases, they, they really are just kind of regurgitating the weather information that's out there kind of in, in a raw format. And they package it and make it look all nice and everything, but they're not really doing anything in terms of uh, interpretation or, or call it guidance, uh, whatever word you want to use. And, you know, let's face it, this is where most pilots are going, at least GA pilots, are going for most of their pre-flight planning, um, even in-flight analysis. It's, it's happening in these apps. And so I'm just kind of wondering, that's my question, what outreach has happened, what outreach possibly could happen with these vendors directly, share the information that we've been talking about here, and hey, hey what could you guys do in your products and hand off some of that to industry to do? So I'll adjust a, a piece of that, and I'm sure others will have, you know, other input as well. I know that from what I've been told as of about two years ago, because this was pre-pandemic, um, that they don't have meteorologists working to help with that translation, but they do employ human factors experts, and that they are the ones, people like Ian, people like Dr. Carroll, who go in and kind of say, here's how a pilot thinks, here's how they handle tasks, here's how they handle decisions, here's the best way to kind of lay out the weather information on ForeFlight. And I will say, both as a, as a user of ForeFlight, as somebody who understands meteorology with, you know, as a meteorologist kind of thing, I find it okay. You know, there are a lot of things in there that I'm like, okay, I think that this is an okay way to kind of showcase. And I've got friends who use it and they think it's all right as well. But to address the other part of your question, I don't even know where I would really start other than trying to, you know, because you don't want to go in and say like you're doing it wrong, right? You know, you want to kind of avoid that and kind of go more towards we're looking to work with you, make sure that these, you know, concerns are addressed, kind of find out what your thought process is, is kind of you're developing these tools within ForeFlight. And I know, um, Mark, I didn't know if you wanted to jump in there as well and I had something. No, that's good. And uh, I do know that I don't know from Garmin's side, but ForeFlight has a lot of pilots on staff and they, you know, they, we talked earlier in this, in the previous session about pilot input and they do take a lot of pilot input. Yeah, they're not meteorologists, but they're the decision maker. So what of that meteorolo meteorological information do I need to make that decision? And I, I know that gets integrated into the development of the app itself. Okay, back here. Yes, ma'am. Right, thank you. Um, one of the things that um, we all know is that there's a lot of meteorological information out there, but the practical application of that meteorological information takes a lot of time. And when we think about it in today's culture, people want things instantly. They want to know it right now. They don't have time to think about it. They want it instant. So when you think about the information, yes, we have all the technology, we have everything there, it's there at your fingertips. But when you think about back in the day, before we had all this technology, we had to learn it. We had to understand the why behind the what. But now they just wanna know the what. They don't wanna know the why. They don't wanna know the concept. They just wanna give it to me so that I can go. So the problem is, is that there, there's not enough time and technology is advancing and advancing and advancing so fast 
until they can't keep up with it. So they're not learning it. And so it's every time you look up, there's a new toy. If you look at your cell phone, it's already out of date because they it's going faster and faster. So that's the same thing with the with aviation and and all of the weather information that is out there. So you the aircraft accidents are increasing and and all of these issues are coming up is because things are moving so fast, but we're not processing it. They're not digesting it. So that then the the learning processes are really, really there. So when you think about it, and, and I was sitting back there, where do you start? Well, it has to start from the beginning. And so Marilyn alluded to that, and several of you have already alluded to that. We have to start with our ground schools at the very beginning to infuse basic weather knowledge at the beginning so that then it becomes a part of the fiber, part of the beginning, because starting in the middle, it's almost like, well, I already have my ratings. I already, let me just get enough to get by. But if we start at the beginning, then now it's a part of the process and they grow up with it. So it's like when we were in high school, everybody had to pass English. You couldn't get out of high school without English. So it's almost like, well, maybe you can't get to the next level without passing a certain part of weather. It could be something that could be thought about, but it's a problem that we have the answers, but we have to figure out how to put it, put them in there. So preach, Jen, preach. Well, <laughs> yeah, thank you. All great. Thank comments. you. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Marilyn wants to respond to that. Thanks, Janet. Um, Janet is is great to work with. She's spot on. So designated examiners now are required to test from a scenario based perspective. But I find most of the time the questions on the tests are not scenario based questions. We've talked about this offline a couple of times about, uh, you know, Bruce so eloquently said that the questions were stupid. So can we make the questions less stupid and make them a scenario based question where if we have a TAF, let's not ask the question of, you know, at such and such a time, the weather is forecast to be and you have A, B or C, but maybe a question that says something like you're a VFR pilot. When is the best time to do your flight from wherever to wherever? And you look at the TAF and interpret a best time. Now we're, maybe testing the knowledge transfer and not just memorizing an answer. So how can we influence that to, to go with more a scenario based training and testing? Joel, a, a request for the speakers in the room, not not the panelists necessarily, but the but the audience members in the room and the audience members online. If you'll be so kind as to identify yourself before you begin talking, it'll really help a lot of us to connect the dots properly here. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. And I, I do want to move the conversation along. We've got a little bit of, of information to get through here in about 47 minutes. Um, so for those that are online, if you wouldn't mind just putting your questions in the chat, I'm monitoring it here from the uh, front. So we're going to try and circle back around to those first when we get to the end of the session here. Um, but I would like to make sure that we are able to continue and talk about the dispatch perspective as well here from Debbie. Sure. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Joel. I'm just going to uh, pretty much echo uh, what my pilots uh, have said. Uh, you know, there is a, a lack of uh, weather training. The 121 regs only list the minimums. Those are the minimum uh, training that we're all supposed to get. Certainly not meteorologists. And and I'll add a little bit more to the um, um, newer generation coming up. It used to be that a lot of um, Aircraft dispatchers, uh, I worked with one who was a meteorologist uh, before, actually a couple of them before they became dispatchers, a little more unusual these days. Uh, certainly a lot of us used to be pilots or have some sort of pilot training, at least a, a private uh, license where you got introduced to weather, right? You had to pass some weather to get that private pilot's license. You had to pass some weather to get the instrument rating. You had to do some weather again. Maybe it's the same weather, but you had to do some to, to get the commercial. You had to do some 
uh, and and now they you know um, they may have that, but uh, they might just also just have the dispatch uh, uh, certificate. So so maybe that's that's the only uh, test they they pass to to get uh, and uh, just met the minimums. Of of course their carrier uh, does the training as as well, but again they're they're generally hitting uh, minimums and then and then recurrent training. Um, there's a lot to squeeze into that bag of of recurrent training tough to put uh, more than five pounds of sugar in a five pound sack so uh you kind of you kind of wind up you, you'd like to do more we'd always like to do more we'd like to uh, add in some more uh, uh training on stuff but at, at some point there just there just isn't time and um speaking of time if we can go right into the uh, next slide i know we were all also all talking about uh potential uh, solutions to this and and the fact that uh, I'll speak to the uh, timing portion since since that was brought up, everybody wants those quick, fast nuggets. That's absolutely true in the 121 world as well. Because don't forget, we're sitting down. They're they're running from gate to gate. The pilots are. They're pulling up their papers and and have to do a pre-flight and and check the airplane before they. Oh yeah, let's and somewhere in there, really quick, check the weather. Maybe they have time to call a dispatcher real quick, but only for a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, they got to get going and, and the dispatcher has multiple flights. Uh, so again, we have to sit down, take a, take a briefing from somebody else. It's usually a hot seat. And now you sit down, you have flights in the air, ones to plan up. You don't have a ton of time. It's, it's, it's better to get the, uh, yeah, the, the nuggets of, uh, the stuff before you can generally, we have a little bit of time somewhere in our shift to okay now now it's a little more downtime i can i can dive a little deeper into the into the weather websites and take a closer look but but not always on a, on a busy day um but uh recurrency uh training uh, certainly uh, if we could bring in all the stakeholders uh so pilots if we could actually do it together uh i know it's a, it's a crazy thought uh, but pilots, dispatchers, and oh my gosh, how about some ATC folks? If you could pull in some, even some local folks uh, from from whatever local center, and and have us all do the same training, in the same way, and learn the same tools. I I know there's still a lot of extra tools that we don't uh, all use. Everybody has their proprietary. Everybody has their different uh, airline ones. But there are some basics that we all use that we could certainly all. Uh, all get the same sort of training on, so I'll kind of toss that one up. Um, and any sort of cross training, um, dispatchers have to sit with, uh, go out and do a route call once a year, get five hours sitting in a cockpit. Um, there's no such requirement for pilots to come in and sit with dispatchers or sit with air traffic controllers. I can tell you at United, we had we used to have a program pre-COVID. Um, uh, I'm sure we'll be getting back to it where the pilots would come in and, and sit with dispatchers, not for a whole shift, just for a little bit because they then circle around and go to the ATC coordinators and the, and the meteorologist and just kind of see how the NOC runs in general. But certainly any amount of time uh, uh, in there. And, and that was above and beyond what they're required to do. That's just a thing that United Airlines does. Um, but certainly um, any sort of cross-training requirements, uh, I think, would be good for all of us. You want to add into that, Mark? No, that was good. Yeah. Matt, I think we're two slides next, please. Oh, okay. But I want to make a comment. Okay, go for it. As a former airline meteorologist, airline aircraft dispatcher, ATC coordinator, I probably learned more about how what I did in any of those roles impacted pilot decision making and ultimately ATC or traffic manager decision making when I went and spent time in those two environments. I, I, I read it in the book, I heard the stories from the teachers, but you know what? Sitting up there in the pointy end of the airplane and seeing how that decision making took place and frankly how narrow that aperture of information was the decision making was what was uh, was being based upon gave me an appreciation and probably made me as chatty as I am nowadays because there's so much context that is lost up in there and that's that's so dang important for those folks. Two slides Roger. 
One question in the back here very quickly. Not a question, I just want to piggyback on that. Jennifer Struz is with the Aviation Weather Center. As a meteorologist, I've been begging for years to be able to do fan flights again. Uh, my first day in the weather service was 9-11, so they all got shut down <laughs> when I started, but I heard about them. And I'm just so interested in getting that perspective, and I think it will make us better aviation meteorologists. Anyone in this room know if there's any hope of that ever coming back? If, if F. Paul would get off its butt. Sorry, if F. Paul would um, would put a, perhaps put out a position on that, maybe maybe we could just at least spark a little bit of a conversation. Don't don't we need a chartered? <laughs> you know, if I could chime in, <clears throat> uh, I can offer to you on a one on one basis the the opportunity to be able to do that. We do have the ability to do that, it would require clearance from my POI, but I think we could definitely get that if you really wanted to do it. And then I think Marilyn also had a, an, an input. Marilyn Pearson, formerly with FAA, not long ago, and we used to get that question. Um, why can't we jump seat again from uh, all kinds of individuals, um, mostly air traffic or radar facility or whatever? It has to do with 9-11 and the security and the fact that there's that door now. Um, so you're not essential uh, to the crew. And unfortunately, even though that's a great learning experience, and even myself as, as an FAA inspector, I was authorized and I would jump seat from A to B and observe. And sometimes the observations were pretty scary watching new pilots. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's a great learning experience, but sorry, no. Throw in the plug that we are also federal employees, so I don't know if there's any way to. I am a. Well, we do have authorization <laughs> for the flight for the air traffic controllers. But, but even if you can't uh, go into the cockpit, I think it would still be great if we could all get in a classroom together. The I agree. dispatchers, 100%. the pilots, yeah. the, any of the meteorologists, or. I, I, th I still think e even if we couldn't get into a cockpit, all right, I understand the rules and the, uh, all of that, but, but even a classroom, even a classroom together, learning, again, learning the same thing in the same way, I think it would be very good. Yeah, I agree about air traffic. I talked yesterday in a center was for a while too. I was fortunate to spend some time at Kansas City Center in my previous position, and that was eye-opening because you really get to see how other information is used. So, if anyone saw Tech Talk yesterday and Professor Lori Brown's talk, that's exactly what VR and AR is supposed to do. Now you can all be in different places. They can replicate a cockpit, and you can all be pushing buttons at the same time in your own home location. It takes some mechanization, but that's why we're looking so heavily at VR and AR because it's safe, accessible, and much more affordable than everybody having their own SAM. And you can remotely be in the same room uh, through using, I forget even what they call the creatures that they make, so you can actually see yourself there. Avatars. Avatars, there you go. And Gary, you're you're a very young thinker for an old guy. I'm really uh, impressed that's with that. That's what we're doing. I, I, I was going to bring up the one simple question. I just think um, what you keep saying is weather is doing, it's not a thinking process. And that it's like flying, you can't get a license without actually flying. You can't make a sports team just by textbook learning. You got to go out and practice the sport. I, and that's what we're looking at VR. I, I have been convinced more and more, and some of the data we just started, I don't have a lot of data to back it up, that it is an activity that actually requires practice and doing. And it's not a textbook thing like an accountant where you learn the rules of uh, how to file your taxes. It, it takes practice and you actually have to be in the situation. You need the time pressure and all the other things that go with it to actually learn what you're doing. You know, what occurs to me as, as we're talking here is that we're really talking about uh, what in, in the day used to be called, maybe still is called CRM or crew resource management, but we're defining crew a little bit differently here with a, a different, uh, a number of additional players that are all part of your crew at that point to make a flight occur successfully. And that crew is going to be changing here in 10 years of what that looks like. And we're going to go to that in just a few minutes. Wow. <laughs> you know, I'm curious. This is uh, Dave uh, from A to B C again. 
I'm I'm kind of curious because we were talking about the fan flight piece, but we were also, you know, very much talking about bringing the pilots out to spend time with the ATC coordinators and dispatchers. Anecdotal show of hands in the room and online from the Mets. How many of you have gone to a knock for an airline? I I got to spend the better part of a half day in Atlanta, Georgia, with one of the major air carriers. And let me tell you about how that opened up my eyes to what was happening there for that individual and what I was able to bring back then to um, to my shop at the command center, but then cross feed that out to the CWS using the weather service was hey, get out there, visit, see what they're going through. So they may not be necessarily using all your weather products because they've got company weather, but you need to get out there. And so it's not just fan flights too. And I'm, I'm kind of, so I, I saw a couple hands go up, but I didn't see a lot go up. And I, I think, there's an onus on us to not just sit there and say, I want to go fly in the front end of an airplane, but I want to go see the sausage getting made behind the scenes too. I can learn better from that. So if you're not doing that and, and, and you have that opportunity now, please, by all means do. I know COVID has really kind of made a mess of things, but we're past that uh, to a degree now. Do that. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's probably an easy position for the FBA to take. I was just going to add in, we love visitors at the Aviation Weather Center. So if you're ever in Kansas City, come see us. So I have to ask Jen, you know Eric Jennings then, right? I do, yeah. We're going to share stories. Okay, so real quickly then, Hello. because we've only got... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's Kozak from online, NBAA. Go ahead, John. So, yeah. The, uh, the the conversation, um, something that I recall doing years ago was uh, getting in a simulator and just getting in a simulator with the pilots uh, was an eye opening experience. So um, I, I think there's more than one way to uh, to attack this particular item. Uh, but I think everybody's right here. It, you know, the more of us who get together in one room at one time and have a little chat it, the more we learn about what each other are doing so yeah and and marilyn um i think there's a fundamental simulator redesign question at play here which is it's got to have more room for more than just or, or connectivity so that Instead of just the, the pilots and the instructor in the cab, there are also other people connected to it via VR, AR, XR, whatever our, we're talking about. So, Matt, I'll, I'll answer that. Instead of making more room, we're actually making less room because we're doing offboard iOS and a lot more offboard uh, evaluation and training. But that doesn't mean that, that you're not still involved in the activity. You're just not inside the simulator, if you will. And yes, the VRMR, and because I work at CAE, I'm pretty familiar with all of that. So there's a possibility. Um, maybe CAE would entertain some of this. So now let's pivot just a little bit, and we'll go down again to the 91 general aviation pilot kind of thing. I don't have much time, so we're going to go in a super fast way around. I'm going to start up in the upper right hand corner and we're going to go clockwise. So as we've said before, CFIs are the ones that are teaching the weather. The students are left up to pretty much their own devices of going out and understanding it. If they don't understand it from their CFI, Google uh, is often involved in there. Are they getting the right search results? Don't know. Weather testing, um, I'm not going to say it because I think it's going to lose its impact if we say it, but the question still remains, how can we insert weather in a way that makes that statistic not so shocking? You know, what is it that we can include somewhere else in the training or in the career to where even if they do fail every single weather question, we're like, you know what, that's not a big deal because they've got this makeup, you know, we can make up that information somewhere else. Um, again, lower right hand now, pilots are not meteorologists, we know this. Pilots don't need to know whether to fly an airplane. They don't, but they need to know whether to operate in the NAS because if they don't, then they're gonna get themselves and the pi uh, passengers in trouble. Uh, available training, we've got a lot of it. Um, the truth is, is that there may actually be too much. I was sharing a story earlier where pilots come up and say, okay, I've got all of this weather information. 
which one's the best? Well, same thing can be said for the weather training that we have out there. We've got all of this training. Which one's the best? There's a lot of training on fasafety.gov. I believe, Marilyn, you pointed me towards three courses um, that I found on there about translating and how to understand. Is it just me or did it feel old? It felt a little outdated to me. Let me just update. There are quite a few courses, but the one that is the most relevant has to do with uh, AC9192 and the expansion on that. And I don't know the title of it, Frankie or Janet, you were in the development of that course. And it's, it's pretty new within okay. a year. So it's very relevant, very interactive. And there's it's geared toward the 91 pilot, maybe the CFI as well, the student pilot, and the IFR version is coming out very soon. Perfect. Um, if I may, Question. if I could speak on that. Um, the VFR WINGS course is the course that was just released. We've had over 5,000 pilots that have already taken the VFR WINGS course. It's very comprehensive. It has, um, it has scenarios. It is one of the best um, VFR courses that um, is out there right now. We've gotten hundreds of reviews by pilots and CFIs. We also have the IFR course that is in development that will be out in the end of May. Um, extremely comprehensive um, for the student IFR and also the experienced IFR pilot. Um, and the scenarios um, range from um, least experienced to the most experienced. So we look forward to that being released by the end of May, 1st of June as well. Perfect. Thank you. Then, yes, I will definitely be sharing that information. Although, to the point I was trying to make is we've got a lot on FAAsafety.gov. Um, the search is, in my opinion, a little overwhelming um, in terms of the information that's available out there. I know it's all good. It's just right in your face all at once when you get on there, and it's kind of difficult to sort through. So how do you point you know exactly what you just said there, Janet. How do you point these these pilots to the right trainings to actually take out there? The the good ones, the ones that are rated that highly, the ones that are free, et cetera. Um, and then I guess that goes right into the effective changes. You know, how do we make that effective change? How do we sit there and actually point those pilots to the right trainings, to the right tools, to understand the how these work? I actually wrote down a, a note for me here. Um, I forget where I put it, though. I've been marking so many darn things over here. Um, they're trained. Uh, oh, this is it. You're, you're training pilots on how to identify broken gauges. You know, my static system ice is over. My static port ice is over. What can I expect the, in the engine instruments to do? What can I expect the flight instruments to do? How can we do that with the pilots? How do we train them the how, the the, the inner workings of these these the, the weather data that we provide to them? How can we actually tell them to recognize when it's broken? How do we tell them when it's working? How can we do all of this kind of thing? And I, I see that flight service just uh, grabbed the mic, so I'm going to let you ask your question here. Frankie Broad from Flight Service again. Um, more of a comment than a question. You're asking, you're asking us. What's the right training? How do you point at pilots? There's not right answer. You need all the resources because people train differently. They learn differently. So maybe what works for me won't work for you. So you do need 10 different trainings for the same information because they're all different. And, and they're not going to be the same, the same way of teaching, and they may not be the same way for the student to absorb the information. So that's why it's important that, yes, there's a lot out there, but there's no right answer of which one is best. <laughs> Marilyn has something to say. <laughs> we're like a tag team here. Um, so if I could go back to the, the course that we were just talking about, it was developed by pilots, air traffic, flight service. So we had METs, non-METs, pilots, pilots who were METs. So I really would encourage anyone to look at it, comment on it. So. To your point of we all need to learn together or work together, this was a compilation of all of our knowledge toward the same goal. Um, so I think what's the best training? The best training is if we can all get together and, and work toward improving it from everybody's perspective. 
no perfect conversation here. And I think that also flows in nicely to the scenario based training as well. I was really glad to hear that that training had pieces of that. It was vital um, in my recent uh, back in 2020 is when I got my instrument and I was trained up very nicely, thankfully, by my flight instructor to prepare for scenario based training. And it hit hard with my DPE. Um, it was not a great thing that he actually knew that I was a meteorologist because all those weather questions were really hard. So um, it, it, it's coming. I'm, I'm glad to hear the scenario based training is there. I want to also hint. I don't want to open the floor up because I want to continue to move. Um, but I did see a comment in the uh, chat about digitization and digital and working towards that system. I think that the trainings that we're developing through FAA safety and through other groups out there, one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face, exactly as Frankie said, is that if we've got so many of these trainings out there, how are we making it applicable to the different technologies that are available in the cockpit. We heard uh, Captain Eden talking about ADSB and FISB. I have a Stratix box based off the Raspberry Pi board that I fly with in the cockpit and I can pull in ADSB information that way. But is there training on what information is available through FISB? You know, is that a, is that a piece of it? So if you've got a FISB enabled equipment, here is the information that you get. Here is what it means that you have access to blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that all of these questions could be addressed in a, you know, larger classroom setting. Um, but the, the 91, the general aviation pilots are at a distinct disadvantage at this point. Um, we've got flight service available to us. Um, I'm going to admit back in December, I called them for the first time in years because I had an issue that I needed help with. I was on the road. Uh, it was a low IFR day. I was going to be flying in icing in a 182. It wasn't going to be a fun flight day and I needed help. And flight service was at a limit at that point. You know, they couldn't give me the answers that I needed because I needed a little bit more in depth than, you know, the, the briefer was able to provide. So we don't have all the tools that we need, but we have a lot. But the question again is which one is going to be best suited for my flight? And that's, I think, a question that the 91 pilots don't quite have the grasp to be able to actually find that answer to. Gary, go ahead. You had seen Tech Talk. One of the products Wittick developed is an app. And the idea being, it's not compatible with everything, but it's just like you said, if you buy a device and it tells you how to push the buttons, but it has a figure and you don't know how to re interpret the information, you know how to push the buttons, you, hold, you scan the picture and that'll give you augmented reality. It'll actually give you a verbal tutorial on how to use that information based on what the picture is in there. And we're trying to get that in more of the instruction manuals because a lot of the manufacturers don't want the liability of quote teaching weather. They don't think that's their responsibility. They're building a device, but they don't want to tell you this is how or where to go with it. Or if it tells you this, don't do that. So linking to FAA approved training materials, all the ones developed by Frankie, Wittick and everyone else, they can just link to that. It's a separate site. It takes you somewhere else. And that's one of the applications of that weather app. So we are trying to fill that specific gap you're talking about. That's perfect. Thanks, Gary. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I think we're going to go ahead and roll. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. Just, just one comment. Before you leave this slide, I would be remiss if I didn't respond to a statement that you made. So you said pilots don't need to know weather information to fly an airplane. I would disagree with that because all of my takeoff and landing data is based on or we call the told card is based on weather information. I, I will concede. I will concede on that one. <laughs> and with that, I'll um, turn it over to Colleen, who will take us into our final presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Joel. Um, all right, so we can go to the next maybe two slides. I'm not going to give any tax advice, so that's we go, go past the disclaimer from my company. Um, so as Joel mentioned at the beginning, we are, you know, we've had this great discussion about some of the challenges that we're facing related to translating weather, talked about different products, talked about some great ideas for trying to bring everybody together and into common classrooms, things like that. But we wanted to wrap this up by turning our gaze forward and looking to, you know, what is the aviation ecosystem in the NAS going to look like in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? So um, the, the first kind of question being, 
Uh, and, and this is going to be kind of a posing this to the audience. So virtual folks, feel free to raise your hand, type in the chat, respond to each other, those in the room, et cetera. We want to start thinking about, you know, what are some of these challenges that we're going to see evolving as we move forward in the next 10 years? The NAS is not going to look like it does today in 10, 20 years. We're going to have a lot of new types of vehicles, smaller vehicles. Some of them may not have a pilot on board. We may have some of the, the current human roles. We talked a lot about dispatch, about pilots on board, et cetera. And while those roles probably are still going to be around in some form or fashion in 10 years, they may not quite look the same. And, oh, we may have some new human roles. You know, we talked a little bit, Joel touched a little bit earlier on uh, UAS operators. You know, th they're going to be on the ground probably and, you know, not in the aircraft. So what does that look like? Um, so kind of the first question just being, you know, what will some of the the challenges that we've talked about in terms of weather translation, what is that going to look like? What are some of the top priority weather challenges that we're still going to be seeing in, in, in 10 years? So we've got 20 minutes to solve this. Let's go. That's a question. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that the challenge is really translating the weather information, but interpreting the weather information. A translation is easy. You can put a METAR in plain language. You can do the same with PIREPS. You can do the same with TAFs. But how do you interpret what that set of data is telling you? It's what's really the challenge. And I, I think that as we progress towards plain language, we also lose, in some instances, the incentive to actually learn what those things mean. Because when you don't understand what it says, just the code, then you also don't have an incentive to try to figure out what it means. So that's that's where I see one of the challenges. Bill Bauman, FAA. Um, in the next 10 years, I don't know, um, NAS 2035, we've talked about the FAA is doing a strategic planning, and um, I might repeat myself this afternoon when we talk about the, the future of the NAS. But in my career, I've been involved in multiple strategic plans, including Air Force and NASA. And some of those started very early in my career in the 1980s. And I actually went back and dug up some of those plans that were for 15 years or 20 years in the future. And I predict, as a meteorologist, that what we're doing now, we're going to be wrong. Because those plans were wrong. I looked at them and I was like, oh man, I can't believe we thought this is what the world would look like in 15 years. And actually, most of the errors in there was we had no idea in the 80s and 90s how fast technology would move as we went into the late 90s, the 2000s. That's where all the mistakes were made. And I think we are more aware of that now. But I look at NAS 2035, or Charting Aviation's Future, and no matter what comes out in that final report from FAA, which is still draft, as I mentioned, it's going to be wrong in some aspects. And we have to be able to pivot on those and not look too far in the future. Mike, we were talking about weather strategy for the next three to seven years and made the comment that next gen looks out a lot farther. That's true, but I predict it probably won't be right. So we got to be careful of what we're looking at way off in the distant future. Input this time, I'm going to be very cynical on the challenges. I think they're going to be the same. And here's why I say that. Uh, almost, I hate to say how long ago, but about 40 years ago, I used to design flight management systems. At that time, it was trivial. We could have put weather in there and told you exactly where to go. Take the pilot out of the loop. Flight management will not only point you in the direction of your flight, it'll take weather into it. Reason you don't do it is liability and lawsuits. That's never going to change. That's only going to get worse. The, the roadblock to automation to make this trivial for any person out there is the risk of crashing an airplane and the liability to people to build it. Building things that would totally remove the pilot are trivial. If we could, I could have done that back right out of college without any problem, and the weather's only gotten better. 
as long as that risk is there, manufacturers are at, always have to treat it as very advisory and they're so careful about trying to make decisions for the pilot or anything that could come back that says that guy crashed because you told him to do it. So Mark Klopfenstein from AvMet Applications. Um, I think one of the challenges that are, it's gonna persist. It's the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in translating weather today. Is, and it's really more of a human factors question because it, it shows up in other industries as well. Taking stochastic, inherently stochastic or probabilistic information and converting it into that decision making. So I would challenge you, Gary, I, I could build a plane that will do all the decision making for me without the pilot, but it's gonna follow the set rules. Could be an AI system and stuff like that, but inherently um, probabilistic information, you know, it's 40% chance of a bad encounter. I'm always right, you know, from that perspective. You know, if you think about that. So if I have a bad encounter, well, it's the 40%. If I don't, it's the 60%. But as a pilot or a dispatcher or any other decision maker, I have to make that decision. Now I can hedge my bet. I can, you know, wait for more information a little bit later down the, the path, but I have to make that decision. That's the inherently the problem here. And usually that gets us into risk management strategies. And I've talked to a lot of people they don't understand what risk ma management means. Unless you talk to the poker players, you know, they have a little idea. Um, but when you're trying to beat the house and the house has a 51% chance of winning, why are you playing? So anyways, I just offer that as one of the fundamental ch challenges to solve. No, and I, it, it's funny because I'm about to do something that really drives me crazy when someone does it to me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first say, Kevin Kronfeld, I see you in the presenters list, and I know that you're probably embarrassed that I'm calling on you right now. I don't know if you want to bring up anything about what the multi, I forget the exact name, I've been out of Collins for so long now with the radar system that aims to actually do that. Hey, Joel, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, can you can you repeat that last part? I actually kind of took yeah. off my microphone and everything. Can you re just repeat that? No, you're you're fine. Um, so it was probably it was more aimed towards the building tools, building products that try and take away the need for that human decision where it tries to actually predict and just kind of give an actual decision to the pilot directly to actually avoid storms in essence yeah i mean so in our, in our experience and the, the the one i can i can just point to from my own personal experience from a product development was when we transitioned our um <clears throat> The, the airborne radars from a from a manual to a fully automatic system kind of where you're trying to you know kind of hey this is where the threats are at this is what you need to avoid and and <clears throat> that type of experience and you know from just from that and then that's that's it i'm not going to say that what i'm you know I, again my experience is just from that that scenario and so you know your mileage may vary but i'm gonna i'll say it just anyway so as as we started doing that one of the things that you, you have to be able to do is build that trust with the with the end user and that takes time it's going to vary as we kind of talked about based on the um different experiences and you can translate experience to age or you know you know lack thereof or you know whatever you know that's all going to influence that that experience and so but the end of that 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 trust comes back to um, um you know kind of you know why why is this tell why is this um uh solution you know being provided to me and and the and that that uh, pilot or dispatch person, they, they need to understand that that why to build that trust. And, and that kind of comes back to even some of the training things that we were talking about people bringing up. Um, you know, if, if in a normal situation with weather where there's, where it's pr pretty benign, you can do any sort of training for, for weather, right? Because there's really nothing to really, you don't really need to understand the why. You just say, this is the result sort of thing. But, but the understanding of the why will then allow you to handle those off nominal those non um, uh, obvious situations. And so that's kind of where, um, you know, when you're doing that automation, providing that probabilistic information, um, that can create some, some challenges because at the end of the day, they, the, the end, uh, the pilot, the dispatch, whoever it is, needs to 
needs to needs to trust that system, needs to trust that automation, and just given a probabilistic value, um, isn't always isn't necessarily sufficient. Um, and so they need some of that experience. Um, and I think I heard someone talking about how do you do so, how can you do some of that um, you know training, even if it's not in the real world, you know, but maybe you know simulation related to kind of build that confidence in, in the systems. Um, you know, start hearing things like explainable AI and, and things like that. I don't throw in a, throw out a bunch of stuff, so I apologize. I'm jump, it sounds like I'm jumping around, but but these things, my point is all of these things are necessary. The probabilistic information is critical because that's necessary for, you know, um, for understanding the information, but then the end use of that probabilistic information, uh, those systems that use that and the end user, it needs to be distilled into, you know, a go, no go decision, right? And and then the people that are ultimately getting that no go, that no, you know, go, no go, go decision, they need to have that trust in that system. So how do you, you know, how do you do that? Um, and so just from our, my own personal experience with some of that automation and some of that uncertainty and, and, and things like that, implementing solutions for the end customer, that it, it's not a, um, um, it takes some time to build that trust, um, you know, for the, for the end customer to, to and, and end you should do that. So I hope that kind of answered and maybe gave a little more color to some of the um, um, discussion there, Joel. Um, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, Danny Sam's FAA. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think it was very, very insightful what Bill said. You know, if you look back what we were predicting 10 or 15 years ago, we got it completely wrong. But I think there is value in looking back where we were and, and where we are today. And one of the areas, I mean, you, we, we used to have polygons. We used to have areas, and we still have them. But, but what we have in weather information now is much finer detail, much finer resolution, both horizontally and vertically. And that's going to continue to grow, but it's it's there's still the idea of um, well that's absolutely correct, and and it, and it never will be. There will always be uncertainty associated with it. So as we move to finer and finer resolutions, the challenge is still that, um, and and I think it's been spoken of by by other people. Um, we live in a society today that says, give me the answer and I want to know it. I want to know right now. And am I in the clouds or am I out of the clouds? Am I in icing or am I out? Am I in turbulence or am I out of turbulence? And the one time where it doesn't pan out, it's just like, well, that product's no good. So it's, it's that almost a holistic type of approach that we have to take that it's not weather in and above itself. Weather will never ever be 100% accurate because it always changes and we never measure everything exactly like it is and there's always the uncertainty with it. So it's, it's those types of challenges that we will continue to be faced with. But we are moving to products that certainly do have more granularity and more detail in them. But with that data also, it's the role of the meteorologist is going to have to change uh, and, you know, as, as we talked a little bit about yesterday, they're not going to be able to keep up with the vast amounts of data. And unfortunately, I think also is we have more and more who may not understand the whys, even in the meteorology field. I mean, we're told to trust in the models and just believe that. And that's what your forecast then come out of. So what's the role of the human then if that's all you're going to do? So there's there's just a lot of things that are that are in there, but it is helpful to look at where we are or where we were and how things have changed. From the FAA, so I'm I'm the non-met, so I'm gonna say one thing. So I would propose that weather is always accurate. I'm gonna well, punch a hole in it, punch a hole in it. I think it's our ability to use the weather that's maybe inaccurate. So. That's me throwing it out there. Um, but what I want to say, you say, what are the challenges? I think perhaps the users and the developers, both systems and um, weather, must um, each understand the requirements and the limitations. And more important, I think, this can't be done in a silo. And it definitely can't be done based on one's person's personal experience or professional. So that's what I think.
button here. Um, yeah, I just had one or two thoughts on the, the, the training aspect of this uh, and, and looking forward. And, you know, it, it's funny. I think technology in, in a lot of ways is uh, our, our, our best friend and our own worst enemy uh, at the same time. And uh, I, I think, unfortunately, we have not only in weather, but in just about every other aspect of our lives now, we've, we've transitioned into learning things electronically. You know, and, and that's that can be a really good thing. It, it certainly broadens the, the scope of, of uh, being able to get education out there. But I really feel like we've lost something in doing that. And so I'm just kind of throwing this out there to, for, for food for thought and in thinking about how we're going to try to en engage and, and educate the next generation of meteorologists, pilots, controllers, whoever it might be, and try to find ways to continue uh, providing opportunities for training in person with with humans. You know, for, for me personally, my best, uh, where I really learned, I think, to understand weather was in uh, dispatch training. Uh, and, you know, I'd been a private pilot, even an instrument rated pilot for many years before that. But it wasn't until I went to, uh, to dispatch school and was blessed with a, a really gifted uh, instructor who thoroughly understood the way the atmosphere works in three dimensions and trained uh, uh, trained us on on how to to, uh, to to look at it and how to to use the weather um, and I don't know that you could really get that with a, a an online course or uh, you know whatever it might be it, you need to have that that human interaction um, with somebody at some point that's going to give you that light bulb moment where you oh I get it um, and uh, so anyway, I'm kind of rambling here a little bit, but yeah, it's, it, it, I just think that's really important. I, there was a, there was a class that I took years ago. Uh, ironically, it was a ministry related class, but it, they, they made the point about teaching and it, the idea of it, or the, the, um, the job of a teacher isn't to teach, believe it or not. The job of a teacher is to cause the learner to learn. You know, it's a really important distinction. And if we're just throwing information out there, um, in, in online courses and, and better looking weather products and everything else, that's all good. But if we're really going to cause people to learn weather and really learn, get them to understand weather, it's going to require um, finding ways to engage people like you were talking about, I think, yesterday. And, and it's getting more challenging to get people to, to really care about weather. And that's something where, you know, maybe we as AOPA, uh, obviously, there's things I think that we can do through through our organization, through our Aviation Safety Institute, other aspects of our organization. But I think it's incumbent on all of us to find ways to try to make that happen. Yeah, and I think just to add on to that, that those are great points. And I think you know what we heard earlier in some of the human factors discussion is about the need to tailor that to the mental model and how the recipients and and the learners are collecting information. Um, so as kind of, I guess, a, a somewhat maybe controversial thing to throw in there with two minutes left right before we transition is that thinking through who those learners are and who those operators are, there's a lot of discussion now about how the pilots of the future for some of these remote operations are going to be people playing video games today. They're not pilots like like these guys and, and everybody else that we've been hearing. They're coming at this from sitting there and, and they're great at, at doing that but they're coming into this from a different perspective. So it's still important that they learn about the weather, that they learn from that perspective, but the the curriculum, the way that we teach them, the way in which they learn may be completely different from, you know, the the some of the, the models and things like that that we have now. And I say model as in like a teaching model or, or a process that we that we have. So I know we only have about a minute or so left. Do we have any questions on the chat? We can maybe get to one. Yeah, we've got we Jeff one Arnold. Hand raised. Hey, real quick, I know we've only got a minute left or so, and I've got to jump on a different call. Uh, this is going back just a hair to what we were talking about earlier. So I've been going for the last year to every workshop, air show uh, that I can get my hands on and talking to groups of pilots. And some of the questions that I have been presenting to them and asking them, I've been showing them the statistic that 25% of GA accidents are caused in some form by weather. Uh, then we follow that up by asking the audience how many of them are comfortable with weather if they're being audi uh, if they're being honest. And I've found that 90% of the attendees have have indicated to me that 
they're uncomfortable with weather or weather interpretation. Uh, of the people that do indicate that they're comfortable with weather, uh, when I ask, uh, I'll, I'll usually say, if we up the stakes and put your family in the back seat, are you still comfortable with weather? And usually 50% of those will put their hands down and say that they're no longer comfortable. Uh, those two statistics, uh, one unofficial st statistic and one very official, uh, well-documented statistic to me seem to be very uh, related and interconnected. Uh, and you know, the next questions are why have why hasn't this 25% statistic changed over the last 20 years? It's been it's remained the same. And what are we doing to fix it? Which I think uh, you guys have tried to address as well. Uh, and I've really been pushing self-service as one of the ways that we can address this product uh, this problem uh, by pilots investing in themselves and in their knowledge uh, in the subject area. Uh, by just getting online and attempting to self-brief and getting their hands in the weather so that they start to develop day after day that same familiarity uh, and, and regularness uh, of a very perishable skill uh, that they're going to need to be successful going forward. Um, so just a couple of thoughts there uh, to chew on before I have to jump off for another meeting. No, thanks, Jeff. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pile on a couple of thoughts as we roll, ramp, uh, roll this to a close. So the primary question that I want to leave everybody with is somebody's got to be driving this kind of an effort of change. I would like everybody to come back to their, you know, their respective groups and think, what role do we play in this challenge? What role do we have in creating a better way to get this weather information out to pilots at all levels? And then, Mr. Bauman, I, I, I task you, where does the FAA want to fit into this? As a contractor, I know that's not allowed, but anyways, with so so with that, I'll I'll wrap things up and and I'll thank everybody for their attention and their participation, and uh, thank you so much to everybody on this panel. You all have been great to work with, and thank you everybody. Okay, uh, Joel, thank you, and uh, and I already put it in chat, but uh, you do a really good job of leading a session and having your mind in eight places at once. So thank you for that. Uh, that's that's really great. Yeah, I I, I I I I there's a future for Joel in this in this arena for sure. Okay, um, our next session is totally virtual. That is to say, the session lead and the. Uh, the panelists are all virtual. So we're gonna have an empty table up front and uh, we're gonna hear voices from the ether. So uh, Tom Ryan, uh, let me turn this over to you to introduce it uh, while I pull up your slides. Thank you, sir. Joel, excellent job. Well done, great session, appreciate it. So good morning and good evening to everyone. My name is Tom Ryan and Presently, I work as contract support to the flight standards weather team. Uh, but before that, I spent some time as a Fed working with weather in both next gen and flight standards. So this conference is near and dear to me, and uh, I'm grateful for it. Well, about a year ago, just a little bit less than a year ago, we had our first presentation on 5G. Tom Fahey from Capital Meteorologics gave us a presentation, well, put, a uh, put together a presentation on spectrum interference and weather observations. Jordan Girth from the National Weather Service Office of Observation spoke, and Sai Kali Anar Aman from Collins Aerospace as well. And largely what they gave us was a little bit of history on, on the uh, the, the spectrum itself, plus what to watch for and prepare for. Well, now we have a little bit of history with 5G, and uh, and gratefully, we have two distinguished presenters that have worked very hard directly with 5G, and they're going to share some of their uh, some of the science engineering behind it, and some of their common experiences, and some of the differences between the U.S. and the EU. So we have Christina Klausnitzer from Flight Standards and Stefano Prola from IATA. And then unlike Joel's session, I'm gonna ask that we hold all the questions until after Christina and Stefano have briefed us. And I'll ask Christina to brief us first and then Stefano, and then we'll have a, t a period of time for Q&A. So 
Christina, would you be willing to start us off? Absolutely. Good morning. Um, I think you guys can hear me and see me. Um, thank you, Tom. We uh, I appreciate you uh, uh, inviting us to try and educate folks on what's going on here with this 5G chaos. Uh, and in an effort to make friends, dare I say, I was listening earlier, pilots don't need weather to fly an airplane, but they need weather to fly an airplane safely. So uh, I'll give you that much. That is absolutely a true statement. So um, I, we thank you for, for all of all that is done to support an aircraft. I flew KC-135s in the Air Force for 23 years, and until I joined the FAA, I had no idea what it took to keep, to keep us flying safely. Uh, and it's a it's an amazing thing uh, now that I'm not flying and trying to support those aircraft out there and those pilots. So I also want to welcome. I have a couple of my uh, peers from my team are on here to help uh, answer some questions. So um, Doug Pfeiffer and Doug Dixon and, and Kathy Graham are here from the FAA um, just in case there's questions because they know a lot more about different things uh, going on in the 5G world. So anyway, uh, next slide, please. All right, so today I plan to talk about you know how we how where we are right now, how how this has all played out in the NAS, um, some of the mitigations that we've taken that we've taken to keep the NAS safe, and then uh, some comparisons of power levels and different things uh, with the with other countries. Next slide, please. So I like pictures. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of history here. The FCC report and order uh, came out a little over two years ago, February of uh, 2020, uh, saying that they are the, announcing that they're going to establish new uh, operating environment for aircraft in the 3.7 to 3.98 band, which you can see uh, there in the red uh, in the middle of the screen. And about eight months later, RTCA put out, after doing a, a good six to eight month study, they established um, a report and assessed that the 5G telecommunications interference impact um, could actually cause some harmful interference and that the emissions from these towers could degrade radio altimeters to the point that loss of data and or erroneous data could occur, which concerned us quite a bit. Loss of data is one thing, but erroneous data is a whole nother whole nother animal. Uh, we didn't know what that was going to look like. We didn't know what we were going to see, um, but it definitely caused some concern. So we stated our concerns. We pushed our concerns out and the auction still ha happened $81 billion later. So um, money is a, a fascinating thing. So we had a little over a year to prepare. Um, for this to happen. It was scheduled to happen on December 5th. Uh, it got pushed back to January 5th, and then it actually, de they deployed on January 19th. So just three months ago. Um, and the amount of knowledge we have gained in those three months is is, is incredible. It, things that if we could have known them beforehand would have been so very helpful, but we are where we are. And the United States needs 5G, aviation needs 5G, Cell phone users love 5G, so we must figure out how to coexist safely. So, um, so on this slide, you can see, uh, you know, the L band down here at the lower level. That's where all of our GPS, GNSS stuff is happening. You've got the 3.7 to 3.98 in red, and then the radio altimeters here, 4.2 to 4.4, um, and. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, so there is a guard band and it's quite a bit of a guard band, which normally would be fine, but we weren't used to, we were used to very low power signals happening where the, the new red stuff is and from satellites. So we had our protections and our filters, as you can see in the lower part of the graph, are this red dotted line um, because the emissions that were happening in that blue area were, were much lower. Now we're way above the red dotted line, and then we've got these spurious emissions here in that orange orange part that are that are uh, going over. So there's two different types of emissions that we have to to care about: um, the ones above the red line, and then the the orange piece there. 
Um, next slide, please. So the good news was, and it took us a while to even figure this out, was that it was only going to uh, come out in these 46 uh, partial economic areas. Uh, we were supposed to, it was supposed to be these for two years, and we were going to get to figure this all out for two years. Until, of course, uh, Verizon sent out a press release last month. They bought out some of uh, other people who were using um, that part of the band. I don't understand all of that piece of it. And they announced that they're going to operate uh, by the summer uh, in 30 additional partial economic areas to include Denver, Atlanta, and I think some of the Northeast, that's what they mentioned in their press release. So now, I mean, we're just, we are swimming hard and uh, it's been, it's been crazy. Uh, you might ask why we're so concerned. I mean, the radio altimeter, it's, it's a pretty archaic piece of equipment, but it's the only piece of equipment on the aircraft that gives you a direct reading of your height above touchdown. You have your barometric altitude, which is different. So this this actually gives you the, you know, exactly, you know, you go over a little hill and it decreases and, um, and whatnot. And it's tied to so many different systems to include um, the TAWS, EGIPWIS, TCAS, different uh, takeoff guidance systems, auto throttles, um, just envelope protection systems, uh, many other types of automation downrange. So it it feeds. It's been so such a robust piece of equipment that that we've been able to we've taken it for granted, and it's always worked well. And if you needed a new one, you just replaced it. It wasn't the most expensive piece of equipment, um, but now here we are. Um, we are trying to figure out filters, trying to figure out uh, different ways to mitigate and how you know try to build new mops and maps and, and different things to uh, make new radio altimeters that are less susceptible to interference um next slide please so these are some mitigations we put in place um, i'm going to go back a little bit the when i talk about uh, there are there are multiple types of radio altimeters out there, some that are more susceptible and some that are less susceptible. So your regional aircraft, maybe you're going to have more susceptible aircraft. They're not going to have the most modern equipment um, and I'm, I'm stereotyping. So don't pray, don't don't quote me. Um, whereas your more uh, your, you know, different glass cockpits, newer um, type of aircraft are going to have less susceptible so some don't even won't feel anything you know uh beyond their wingtips so unless you've got an emitter on the airplane they might just be just fine but we have to plan for all types of uh, radio altimeters so back in october when we we, we just realized that we were going to have to do something something pretty severe because we we weren't getting anywhere on the political side of it uh, so we did build some airworthiness directives. Um, there's a transport one and there's a helicopter one, and it basically prohibited maneuvers that relied directly on the radio altimeter input low to the ground, such as SA Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3, Auto, Thro or auto Land, um, uh, HUD to Touchdown, EFVS, and, some, and uh, there are four different helicopter uh, operations that were prohibited when in the presence of 5G. Um, so how are they going to know when they're in the presence of 5G? We had to build NOTAMs. So we have this huge list of NOTAMs, which goes against everything we were trying to do previous of trying to get our NOTAMs under control, but we got it. We got to keep the NAS safe. So we have we have a bunch of NOTAMs out there and in within the NOTAM, of course, we have to give those aircraft that had the better performing radio altimeters or the least susceptible radio altimeters the ability to um, not have to follow those prohibitions. So uh, we then once uh, we learn where the towers are, we can uh, put out alternate methods of compliance. And speaking of that, we didn't know where the towers were. We learned that uh, I want to say a about mid-December, and that's when we could finally, maybe it was before that, I can't remember the timeline, so I apologize for that, but that's when we could finally start, start right before 
uh, rollout to figure out how we were going to what we were going to do. So um, much leave was lost, much overtime was done, um, but we figured out how to do that by December 19th to make the NAS to keep the NAS safe. Um, we did come up with some agreements, some voluntary agreements. Uh, I'm not supposed to call them agreements. Voluntary actions by the by AT and T and Verizon because those are the two telcos that we of, are of concern for these first two years. They have reduced the power levels from 65 dBm to 62 dBm. They're only operating in the 3.7 to 3.8 part of the spectrum, and they are they don't want any negative. They don't want any incidents for aircraft either. So they are working with us and um, helping us to protect 114 airports, which we've been able to to do that. And that's that's the number today. So that will change tomorrow. You know, everything's changing. We've been able to protect those airports for the big the, the airlines, commercial air, aircraft, but not as much um, for some of the regionals. Uh, but we're doing our best. We're trying to keep at least one runway at, at the big airports so that they can that they can do their business uh, and operate and all that stuff. And then, of course, there's some additional guidance out there in the in SEIB and in, in SAFO. And the, the FAA actually has a really good website out there, the FAA.gov slash 5G, um, that shows a lot of what, we, what we've done. Um, let's see, next slide, please. So, to finish up my part, um, this this is a difficult slide to read, and I know that, um, and I can answer questions on this later, uh, but the top two, so on the bottom, you've got your frequency. You can see the green part is 4.2 to 4.4, 4. and then on the side, you've got your DBM, the power levels. <clears throat> you can see the US is this bl top blue and orange line. Blue is, uh, the regulatory power limit of 65. Um, orange is where we are um, allowed, where they are keeping it for now. That's at 62. Um, and I have to mention, and I don't have my notes right here, but if, when you go from 62 dBm to 65, you it's not linear. It's logarithmic and it doubles your power. Literally will double your power. And I'm bummed I don't have my notes right here because it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a pretty uh, impactful statement to know that at that at those power levels or at those DBMs that it will double. So those are those uh, voluntary um, things that the that the um, telcos are doing are that's only in place until July, July fifth. So if they don't continue doing that for us, yeah, things are going to change again in July fifth, which is not that far away. Um, let's see, um, other things on the slide that I wanted to show you besides just the United States are, of course, um, you've got this, uh, some European countries right below it, um, a little bit further away. We have, um, Ireland is the yellow, I'm trying to see it on mine. Um, so they're at 61 dBm, um, but they go all the way up to 3.8. Um, beside them is Sweden, Sweden um, so a little bit lower on the spectrum that go up to 61 dBm. Um, below that, the another blue line. Yeah, don't ask me why, how, why this is so hard to read, but not my slide. <laughs> but um, uh, China is right below that one, and then, um, but you can see that the, knowing the, the the correlation between you know the logarithmic uh, power levels as we go down, they get much much less. So Romania, I believe, is that green one at about 55 dBm, and then we have Japan, and then you get some that get closer and closer to the uh, to the 4.2. Um, the closest one there is. UK, so they are uh, trying to. They're at 32 dBm, so just. You know, everybody asks, you know, why is it different? And it is, it's just different. It's very hard for us to compare ourselves to other countries. 
Um, additionally, we have different regulatory, uh, you know, state of design, state of registry, you know, different ways. We we do not regulate the spectrum. The FAA does not. The FCC does, theoretically. Um, I'm supposed to keep that inside. Um, and so that's where we are. So I think this slide says a lot, and uh, I, I would like to now uh, pass the mic to our friend in Spain. Uh, that's where he's living. That's not where he's from. Uh, Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Christina, um, uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Thanks. I will um, give a little perspective on, on what we're doing on the other side of the pond and uh, Halfway also on the on the, from the uh, air operators, the the airline side, because I'm uh, I'm from the from the airline association. So uh, just to well set the scene, um, and uh, I will sort of in a way mirror what uh, Christina said. Uh, I have here a slide where you can see that. Um, the impact for of telecom industry and aviation is, uh, is is quite different. So we we understand why governments are, are looking at, uh, at the two sides of, of this issue, uh, maybe in a different way. Uh, although we know that I mean uh, we in aviation are dealing with uh, potential accidents and, and uh, human loss, while telecom is it's, it's not just uh, on the same on the same level. So. We have to match this this um, uh, this, this priority. Next slide, please. Um, Christina already mentioned in here. You can see it on the graph. Uh, what what are the what are the um, uh, the use for for the information received from the radar? Um, and you can see that uh, many systems. Uh, uh, for example, related to um, to the weather is also the wind shear uh, surveillance, uh, and, uh, and and depending on the height above the ground, uh, some some modes are, are, are enabled or not. Uh, what is very close to the um, to the safety is the use of the EG, EWS, um, so the all the warnings for proximity to the ground to avoid the controlled flight into terrain. And um, and most of all, the, the direct um, feedback that the, uh, the, the altitude has on, on flight controls or various flight controls uh, to end up for controlling uh, directly the, the, the flare um, maneuver during, during auto land. So, it is a very, very um, important uh, um, sensor. Next slide, please. Christina gave uh, a very comprehensive and, and more complete uh, graph on the on the on the on the situation around the world. Uh, here we're looking just at the frequencies and not the powers. But of course, there are um, the, the essential uh, side of the, of the equation. But uh, this is more, more visual to see what are the differences in frequencies, at least. Um, uh, this is just something out of the web. Uh, you see some, some places are closer, some places are, are further out there. Uh, but again, it's mostly the, the impact on the, on the power that is also what is uh, causing the, the the major issues. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, just to, uh, I, will, I will give a little bit more details. But uh, um, on the on the European side, um, we have uh, so we're working. Uh, Eurokai, in particular, together with RTCAs. Are working on the um, on the update of the standards for uh, radar altimeters uh, built many years ago with standards that are, were okay for uh, until uh, 5G came out and then these um, and these frequencies were uh, previously used for satcoms or, or something 
related to satellites which were really uh, low in power. So the protection, the um, it's called, and I, I'm a pilot also by trade, but so I'm not a um, frequency expert. But so the the masks around the 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 transmitters are are sort of not so strong to uh, allow uh, high powers next to them. Um, EASA, so the European Safety Agency for Aviation, is is investigating uh, relativity uh, signals and engaging with uh, with the European Spectrum regulators. Um, also in uh, in Europe, uh, the aviation is not ruling the the frequency spectrum uh, assignment. Um, and uh, that is done through, well, the ITU, but uh, in the ITU we have the, the CEPT, this, which is the, um, uh, the CEPT is the acronym, but it's, it's in French. So the, the European Communication and Postal uh, Telecommunication uh, uh, Organization um, is also uh, active in studying the compatibility so that you have both the sides, um, mobile, and aviation. We as IATA also are contributing, but uh, mostly the manufacturers um, of uh, radars and, and, uh, and, uh, and um, aircraft are, uh, let's say, facing the, the, other, the, the, the mobile um, uh, world. Uh, next slide, please. So also, to have a little graph that is a little bit um, uh, uh, capturing one of one of the issues. So this is uh, out of the RTCA report uh, that came out uh, in the early 2020. That uh, was uh, the the starting point of the uh, of of this. Although many were already working on it, but this was really gave the the the, the depth of the of the issue. Now. Um, uh, I'm quoting a, a risk assessment done by, by an aircraft manufacturer. I'm not, not going to name one. Um, but uh, what they've done <clears throat> is that they, they took the RTCA, um, the RTCA uh, um, worst case. And, uh, and this is what, what is happening for. So in the RTCA, you have three categories. You have uh, um, commercial aircraft, which is category one. Then you have the general aviation business, and then helicopters. So categories in two and three. This is um, this is the impact uh, uh, on uh, on the commercial aviation. And uh, as you see, well, anything that is on top of the black and line, it's it's bad <laughs> in a, in a, in a nutshell. And then you can see here, it's, everything is basically below the line. Um, so, in the assessment of the equipment on board of the of this manufacturer and the the worst case scenario, uh, they've done uh, um, they have done studies uh, simulations and uh, they reckon that there's no safety impact for the worst case scenario that on the on the RCCA uh, study. Um, Slightly different is if you go beyond the worst case scenario, uh, there was one particular manufacturer uh, of, of Radar that had a little bit of problems there. But yet again, um, through simulations via uh, the, the normal, um, uh, abnormal situation that would be uh, happening if Radar was giving erroneous or, or, or non um, indications that also a uh, case would be would have been handled without any any uh, safety safety uh, consequences. So that that was was driving also uh, on uh, on the other side of the fact that uh, they are not considering at the moment uh, something uh, that at least for commercial operators is um, is, is impacting. Uh, significantly the safety. Now, the caveat is that uh, apparently the FCC um, is um, going beyond was, well, uh, and, and, um, and probably providing an, a, a wider uh, 
um, possibilities for power and, and frequencies uh, so that this uh, risk assessment should be uh, reevaluated uh, and, and that's what they're doing right now. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, one second. Uh, adjusting my my device. So here, EASA, EASA is basically all uh, European states plus plus uh, some, and, and you see here the the member states. Um, what they did is uh, they did apply. This is quoting what what they said. So I mean, not taking responsibility for this. Um, they said that uh, they applied the risk assessment as they do for all safety cases. And uh, they recognize at this moment that they don't have hard evidence of unsafe conditions, such as immediate action is required to mitigate the risk. We understand that this um, quite different approach of FAA and EASA is a little bit, um, let's say, not ideal, uh, to put it. Uh, um, uh, in a way that is politically correct, uh, they are. Uh, we, we understand that we had a lot of talks with the other EASA, uh, uh, me part of the uh, safety and flight operations of uh, of uh, IATA in Europe, and so EASA is one of our main uh, stakeholders uh, that we deal with. Um, we are aware that, that uh, EASA is working with, uh, with the FAA. They had a lot of contact. Uh, to try to harmonize this, but uh, this is where we are at the moment. And in fact, um, well, if, if we move to the next slide, we have uh, uh, more detailed actions on the, what it has, uh, is doing. So they did. This is uh, this has happened uh, uh, still last year. Um, we're struggling to get a little bit of more updates on what's going on on this issue from EASA, but uh, uh, they um, asked manufacturer, both aircraft and uh, radars, to have uh, their evidence of uh, what they've uh, done. Um, it's called uh, Continuous Worthiness Review Item Carry. Uh, we have repeatedly asked uh, to have evidence of what happened, but uh, we still don't have that yet. Um, so this is to to assess um, from the from the equipment uh, what was what, uh, what is the situation. Um, they uh, acknowledged the uh, airworthiness directive uh, from the FAA. They did not adopt them. Um, what they did was uh, issuing a safety information bulletin, uh, raising essentially uh, awareness on the, on the situation um, and also uh, though um, uh, of course even European uh, airlines flying into the state they will have to apply all the all the requirements by the set by the FAA um, and those uh, alternative means of compliance that are uh, available for some specific uh, types of aircraft uh, will also be uh, uh, automatically approved by ASA, basically. So the, they, they they can apply those uh, those uh, means of compliance without uh, double checking with with the other. So that that's at least a, a good point. Moving on to the next one, uh, I just like want to mention again what what I I, I briefly uh, mentioned before. So within the um, the form uh, that is uh, relative to the the actual frequency allocation, um, we are dealing as we speak uh, in this group about uh, on talks between again the the aviation community and the mobile community, um, and because also in Europe uh, the the agency the the the, the frequency the CPT. Is looking to uh, enlarge the the frequencies and power allowed uh, by by the mobile uh, operators. Now, uh, I can mention one of the one of the main 
difficulties we have in discussing with the, with the mobile companies is that uh, it's about the risk assessment. So in aviation, we, we are used to assess risk with the worst case scenario uh, facing and, and, uh, and having, um, having to contemplate catastrophic uh, consequences in, in, in the worst case scenarios. Now the, the mobile uh, associations and, uh, and the operators uh, find that a little bit difficult to understand when, when we talk about trying to get, the, again, the worst case of what's gonna happen, they, they, they argue, well, that's ne never gonna happen. So why are you looking, looking really at the worst case? But that, that's the way we do it. Uh, so, and, and, but anyway, <laughs> uh, discussions are going ongoing and, um, and we have a strong team there with, with also EASA uh, active and, um, and, and we'll see. Now, uh, next slide, uh, please. I, this is something out of the web I, and, uh, and this is an example of mitigations uh, that uh, are being taken in, the, in Europe by, by one state in particular, France. Uh, as compared with, with something that is happening in the States, but not blaming or, or saying that one, one is uh, better than the other. Uh, and in fact, things are changing. So this is not maybe reflecting exactly, it's just an example. Um, so, um, and, and, and I didn't mention this one specifically, but uh, so EASA, for example, is on, on, the, on these uh, measures uh, about protection of the, of the spectrum and, uh, and potentially um, uh, mitigations on the side of the mobile are not competent. So these are again the states, uh, the individual states, they, they have to operate. And some, like France, did uh, something and you can see, for example, they limited uh, the, the power uh, significantly. They are asking for a downward tilt of the antennas uh, and uh, quite, large uh, safeguard of deployment around airports of, of, this, uh, of this tower. So um, we as IATA, we consider that what France is been implementing is quite a, 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 um, a, good, uh, a good measure. And we, uh, we are hoping that uh, more, more states will, uh, will uh, implement that. Or similar way. Now, next slide. Uh, looking a little bit of what's going to happen in the future. So, you know, without going into the details, just uh, as an overlook, look, if you see on top industry standards. So, as I mentioned, the RTCA Eurocai are working on to improve the the agreement, Radal, new standard. Uh, they're working hard on it. Uh, hopefully, by end of this year, they're going to have. The, the the minimum operational um, standards uh, in place mostly, uh, but then it's going to take a whole year to fully develop the the, the standards and equipment, uh, ranging 2023-24 uh, to have the first actual um, piece of equipment available to install in 2025. In the meantime. We hope that um, the deployment uh, will still be um, accompanied with mitigations uh, until, and then the, 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 the last line is eventually that, so the, the, the long-term solution will be new equipment on board, protected by, uh, from interference from the, the 5G next to in the frequencies adjacent, adjacent. And, uh, but that's not going to happen for a few years. Uh, we're looking at into the, the end of the, of the decade to, to get the full uh, um, fleet. The older versions, the older aircraft will be um, retired and the new ones will all have uh, the, the improved uh, equipment. Uh, now, the retrofit also will be a problem. Who's going to pay for it? Uh, that's a big problem. Uh, finally, my last two slides, please. Uh, this is going to be about what we as IATA are um, say, uh, trying to push uh, towards government. So um, uh, we have this position 
uh, and it's on our website, the uh, asset.org available. So we, we, we recognize the importance, obviously, of 5G. We all, as, as, um, as uh, citizens, but also as, as aviation uh, operators, will benefit from it. But uh, we insist that maintaining current level of safety uh, should be one of the government's uh, highest uh, priorities. Obviously. And uh, the next slide, please. So we propose some of, uh, of uh, the three uh, actions, basically. Spectrum separation, maintain some, some boundaries, maximum power limit, and some zones around the, uh, the at least the runway, uh, where there is, uh, there is a prohibition to, uh, to actually put the, the antennas. And, then, and in the slides, you'll see also the link to the uh, page where there's a little bit more uh, about this. So this concludes my presentation, and uh, I guess we'll be ready for some Q&A. Uh, Thanks. Thank you both, Christina and Stefano. Um, I can't see the room very well on my little laptop screen, so I've asked for Matt and for Dave to kind of take control of the question and answers. And and I wanted everyone to know, Christina has said there are some answers. Uh, she can provide answers to some of the questions in the chat, but let me uh, leave responsibility with Matt and Dave to run through that, please. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, and looks like that the vast majority are probably aimed at Christina, so uh i think this is probably one of the easier ones there was a question about the number of airports does the fa know how many airports have 5g restrictions uh right now from aircraft conducting some approaches i guess that would equal the number of notams that you have issued so is that a pretty simple sure we've issued about 1500 aerodrome notams and um, the the Joshua looks like he put a pretty good example of one of Minneapolis St. Paul in the chat. Yeah, that was it's pretty much a boilerplate from the ones I've seen. And you say there's about 1500 notams, but how many airports? Uh, because it sounds like I, I don't think there's that many airports that have notams right now. Are there multiple notams per airport or is that? Um, so there, yeah, in some cases, an airport does have more than one 5G NOTAM, but there's um, air, there are 1,500 aerodromes that have this NOTAM. So um, okay. that's including a few heliports and um, a few VFR fields that are kind of used by bigger aircraft. We wanted to make sure they were aware of the restrictions. Um, so 1,500 aerodromes, yeah. Okay. Um, also... Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry, Dave, just so you know, there's at least two questions here in the room, so we'll have to coordinate a, a handoff at this point. We'll, we'll do. I'll get a couple of these, and then I'll let you get the ones in the room, and I'll finish up the ones here. Um, there's a couple of questions kind of related that want to know how much experience have we gained so far with real-world operations that experience safety-critical situations because of 5G um interference and kind of related so i'll let you answer both of these probably at the same time paul freeman has what is the real world effect of 5g on aircraft um and how what happens if the radio 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 radar operation you're flying into an unprotected airport with 5g tower nearby so okay yeah i'll start with that one first um so based off of uh, the reports that we have received, because like I said, we weren't exactly sure what you were going to see on the aircraft. We we had some assumptions. We knew which systems it was going to affect, but what's it going to look like in the in the uh, on the flight deck? Um, and what we have found for the most part, a lot of them are a a flickering radio altimeter, a miscompare between um, the the left seat and the right seat. And luckily, most automated systems can pick that up 
uh, you know, if the pilot is seeing that you're 100 feet above the ground and the co-pilot is seeing that you're 20 feet above the ground, usually there's a uh, a warning light that will tell you that those are miscompared. So that's a good thing. Um, and then the other thing we're seeing is is a, a failed radio altimeter. So which is a flag comes up and it goes blank. So those are a lot of the reports that we're getting. Additionally, we're also seeing um, from the downrange systems. We're seeing an unsafe gear condition because you're your gear warning system believes you are closer to the ground than you really are, so you're getting some uh, unsafe warning systems. Not the gear isn't down; it's just giving you um, unsafe conditions. We've had some auto throttle uh, events, oh, and let me caveat this with all of the reports that we're getting. We cannot say that those are 5G interference. We have no sensor to tell us that those are 5G interference. We just know that something is happening to the radio altimeter on the aircraft, and we are trying to troubleshoot whether if it's maintenance, we can roll it out. If it's not maintenance, can we find any other type of interference? You know, so all we're, we're, it's a process of, process of elimination for us to try and come to any conclusions, but we our conclusions are not solid. I mean, this is a, a new a new thing. Um, so some of the other, you know, sometimes you're getting uh, terrain warnings when you're clearing a million and you can see there's no terrain or TCAS warnings. Um, trying to think those are those are the ones we've seen for the most part, but most of them are are in the radio altimeter itself. But we just know that that feeds the downrange automation and other safety systems. And I think that feeds right into um, the question um, from Matthias uh, Steiner, um, how much experience have we gained? Well, I would say in safety critical situations, luckily, you probably would have heard about them if, if they were safety critical. Um, luckily, we have not seen safety critical systems and we didn't expect to. We expected our mitigations to, uh, to keep the NAS safe. Uh, for those uh, lesser, the, the more susceptible uh, aircraft out there, their own um, operators have, uh, you know, their manufacturers and whatever have put other things in place. You know, Boeing has six other ADs in place um, to prevent, you know, the safety critical things from happening. I think. Um, Oh, I can't remember the other aircraft that has, you know, that tells them, you know, to disengage certain things below 500 feet. So we're not getting um, the the situations that possibly we could be if uh, we didn't have those mitigations in place. Over. Have we gotten any from not in the immediate airport area where there's radiation from uh, towers going more vertically than we're expected or like away? Or somebody has a, a rogue cell phone on in the back that has uh, that they didn't put it in airplane mode for cellular. Doug Dixon, do you want to? I mean, I can answer that, but you might be able to answer that a little bit better. If you come off of mute, happy to chime in uh, <laughs> on that. Am I? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, you probably don't want to see me. Uh, um, we have some reports that uh, of possible interference that occur away from the runway or the area that that uh, that we are protecting with the mitigations that are in place that point to maybe suspected 5G interference. But for the reasons Christina has mentioned earlier, um, we haven't yet through our investigations been able to attribute those for sure to 5G interference. Those investigations are uh, or or detective work, I'll call it, uh, rather than investigations. That detective work is is ongoing. All we can really do is eliminate other things, like you know, an aircraft maintenance issue with the radio altimeter, or some other type of interference, um, or, or other things. We can eliminate those until we finally whittle it down to well, the only thing left is 5G interference, and we're we're still in the in the process of doing that uh, uh, with with some of these reports. But to to directly answer your question, we have received reports. Of, of potential 5G interference that are away from the protected area at the airport. Over. OK, um, and one question that I've got for Tom before we turn it over to the in room 
there was a couple of articles that came out about a year ago uh, about